Good evening and welcome. I'm Adam Block, Chair of the Needham Planning Board, and I call this meeting to order. This open meeting of the Planning Board is being conducted in a hybrid manner consistent with state regulations and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. We have two public hearings this evening that will include an opportunity for public comment related to the subject of those hearings. For the record, I will now confirm attendance of planning board members. When I call your name in alphabetical order, please respond that you are present. Mr. Alpert. Present. Artie Crocker. Present. Jean McKnight. Present. And Natasha Spada. We note for the record that uh, Natasha does not currently appear on Zoom, um, and uh, we hope that she will join us. And Alex, if she does, if you could let us know, please, that would be helpful. Uh, I'd also like to confirm the attendance of our uh, uh, planning department staff. Um, Alex Klee, present, we see the wave. We're grateful, thank you, and Lee Newman. Present. Very good. For others participating uh, in this meeting, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you share in state will be a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website, which is needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. The ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I will introduce each of the speakers on our agenda. As they conclude their remarks, board members will be asked for any comments, questions, or motions. Uh, the following ground rules are designed and applicable to both of our public hearings. The, ground, uh, the following ground rules are designed to provide for public comment in a respectful manner. We ask that you address your remarks through the chair. We ask that you to keep your remarks to three minutes. And it's just as effective to simply say that you agree with a previous speaker instead of uh, repeating the same point that a previous speaker has made uh, for another three minutes. Uh, we will cycle through comments uh, between, um, we will cycle through public comments between this room and on Zoom uh, as we see your hands up. Um, we will allow uh, uh, participants to speak a second time if there are no other additional speakers. Your questions may not necessarily be answered as they come up unless the answer is immediately available either by board members, staff, or hearing participants. Otherwise, we will ask staff to note the question so we can provide an answer on our website or at our next hearing. Your observations are particularly helpful. And if you're unable to speak here tonight, we ask that you please submit your comments. All of the board members do go through our packets thoroughly and especially with comments from the public, which can be emailed to planning at needhamma.gov. That's planning at needhamma.gov. These will be held, as with all other materials, as part of the public record. Our first agenda, uh, our first agenda item this evening is a hearing in relation to a major project site plan special permit number 2022-03 in respect of an application for a 155 unit senior housing project located at 100-110 West Street. May I please have a motion to waive the reading of the hearing notice? So moved. We have a motion by Paul Alpert. May I have a second? Second. We have a second by Jean McKnight. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote. Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Uh, is Natasha present? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, people from uh, uh, Well Tower and Balfour, Mr. Evans, uh, Mr. Huber, if you're able to bring your crew to the uh, table here and join us. We look forward to the presentation.
And as these people assemble uh, in front of us here, we should have, um, we'll give everyone a minute to get organized. We have attorney Evans Hubert. He can respond by saying present. Present. Um, and uh, 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 Michael Schonbrunn. Present. And uh, uh, Julie Nash. Julie is appearing. Uh, Remotely? Uh, yes. Very good. I'm from Balfour. Right very good. Thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth uh, Peabody. Present. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, ben LaFrance. Present. Thank you very much. Um, Eric uh, Fredette. Here. Very good. Thank you very much. Aaron, I apologize. I think I said Eric. It's my brother's name. I apologize. And David Kelly, who I understand is appearing remotely. Do we have him on Zoom? He's been invited. I don't know if he's uh, over. I see. I see him Present. already. Very good. Present. Very good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Evans. You and your team have 25 minutes to present. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So members of the board who are here in person, as well as those appearing remotely, Mr. Crocker, Ms. McKnight. Um, as you know, we're here uh, on an application for the property at 100 West Street um, to uh, develop the building that's currently vacant into a 155 unit a facility that is uh, entirely assisted living, of which and those assisted living include 28 uh, memory care Alzheimer's units. Um, the, this is a uh, partnership, not in a legal sense, but a sort of a partnership between uh, the owner, Well Tower, and uh, the entity that will be operating the facility, Balfour Senior Living. Um, Mr. Sean Bruin from Balfour is here, as well as Julie Nash, who's appearing uh, remotely. Um, we have the same team uh, of professionals that were um, assisting us the last time when we were before this board, uh, when, the, uh, when the operator would have been LCB Senior Living. So it's the same team, uh, the architectural team, Hawk Design, Kelly Engineering, McMahon Associates, um, and uh, we've e also had the same. Excuse me, Evans, may I just ask, is there anybody here from Well Tower? Yes. Yes, there's, we're, we were not planning to have um, Well Tower be a presenter, which is why they're not sitting up here, but we have several people here from Well Tower. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, Mr. Capen, Patrick, is here, and then he has some of his colleagues with him. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, the reason for this new application is that uh, Well Tower and LCB are no longer business partners, that relationship uh, ended and the, the decision was not to go forward with that project. Uh, well Tower uh, is partnering with Balfour, with whom um, Well Tower is engaged in a successful project in Brookline right now um, that's further along in the development process than this one. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a very, uh, Balfour is a very highly regarded um, operator that puts forth a really high quality product for its residents and they'll talk about that very briefly recognizing that we need to be brief we are going to be asking for some zoning relief in connection with this application for special permit first of all we need a special permit because this is a major project um, we need a special permit uh, because we are altering a non-conforming building this building is non-conforming in certain ways the one of the sideline, we don't meet one of the sideline setbacks from a residential neighborhood. Um, and uh, these are the same sorts of nonconformities that were brought up the last time with LCB. We, um, uh, there may be a disagreement about whether or not we need a special permit for this particular use. Uh, unfortunately, the Avery Square Overlay District bylaw, I believe, is ambiguous on that point. One part of it indicates that a special permit for assisted living is required. Another part of it indicates that it would be allowed as a right. So um, we don't want to get into a legal fight about that, um, and it's not a valuable use of anybody's time right now, but um, we're asking for a special permit in regard to the use, the assisted living, 
while reserving our rights to um, take the position, if hopefully will not be necessary, that, that a special permit for that use is not required. And then lastly, we have um, we need a special permit uh, waiving strict compliance with certain aspects of the parking design requirements. And again, these are the same waivers that we asked for last time and were granted. We, uh, there are no comments from the police or fire department on this project. The engineering department has some relatively minor comments having to do with stormwater management. Um, and um, as this board is probably aware, we have been um, engaged in extensive discussions and meetings with the select board um, to try to address the concerns and unhappiness that was first expressed when this, when we met with this board a number of months ago. There was, you know, we're well aware that there are people who are unhappy about the idea that this facility is going to be all assisted living instead of a mixture of assisted living and independent living. We heard that very clearly. We've spent the last few months trying to meet with neighbors, meet with the select board, meet with this board, or at least some of the members of this board, and you know, provide some perspective on why we think this is a good project and one that will be of benefit to the senior citizens of Needham. Uh, and um, you know, the, the independent living um, would have, or did, in the case of LCB, carry with it a requirement for a certain number of affordable units. Assisted living does not have that requirement. And in recognition of the fact that uh, people are you know, somewhere between disappointed and unhappy about what they perceive as the loss of IL units and with it um, the affordable units, the um, applicant is prepared to make a substantial uh, donation to the town uh, to be used either to as a, you know, in the, in the first instance as a donation to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund or some other purpose if the town sees that it's more appropriate. We have reached a sort of an agreement in principle with the select board as to what that number will be. Uh, the number is $1.9 million and, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that the select board is in favor of that. They see that as a significant um, municipal benefit that comes along with this uh, proposal. It's not something that we're legally required to do, but we want to have a um, positive working relationship with the town, not an adversarial one. So that's our, um, we, we haven't formalized that agreement in writing, but we have reached that agreement in principle with the select board. With that background, I'm going to ask Mr. Schoenbrunn and Julie Nash to speak very briefly about um, Balfour. Um, and, and then we will move on to um, the architectural team. Thank you. Thank you, Evans. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Schoenbrunn. I'm the founder and CEO of Balfour. And with me virtually is Julie Nash, who's our chief operating officer. And together, we will not speak for more than five minutes, promise, so we can keep things limited. Um, Balfour is a 25-year-old um, senior housing company first project opened in 1999, uh, and we have uh, a total of um, nine operating projects in Colorado and one in Michigan. And we are uh, actively uh, constructing a project in Brookline and another one um, also in construction in the Washington, D.C. area. Balfour started um, by me uh, as a result of my experiences uh, as the only child of a very demanding um, mother. Uh, and when my father died unexpectedly, um, I assisted her um, in finding a community that she could live in. My own background was in health care. I had been the uh, deputy commissioner of the state health department. And interestingly, at that time, had a number of uh, relationships and working um, conversations with members of Governor Dukakis's uh, health cabinet at the time. Um, comparing notes on um, how to improve quality of care for seniors. Um, the, the company itself, um, as mentioned, has been operating for some time. We take uh, a lot of pride in being uh, medically competent. Um, we are always concerned that um, our staff is um, appropriate in terms of ratios to the, um, 
uh, residents living there, and we make certain that our staff is trained enough, which is one of the issues uh, that we don't have um, very many 9-11 calls at all that we can't handle ourselves. Uh, we think that having an appropriate setting for seniors uh, that really presents uh, a much more um, robust sense of life that the seniors who live in our community, who range from um, late 60s up to late 90s, and in fact, we have a couple of people now in their 100 category, um, you know, um, are still full of interest and activities, and we do our best to make certain they have a robust and lively uh, program, not only on the healthcare side, but on life enrichment, uh, dining, um, activities, um, involvement in the community. Uh, we feel very strongly that's an important aspect. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, ask Julie Nash, who's our chief operating officer, to um, make a few other additional comments. Julie? Thank you, Michael. Um, in addition to being the Chief Operating Officer of, of Belfour, I started my career with Belfour um, st opening um, our Belfour Longmont community, which is our newest community here in Colorado, which is a very similar model to what we are proposing in Needham. And the genesis, Michael's approach to senior living is really about creating the next generation of senior living, not only for the senior experience, um, but also the associate experience. And every day he challenges us as executive directors, as department heads, and as an executive team to look and be thoughtful about what that experience should look like. And that was the genesis of the Longmont community and what we're proposing here in Needle. Um, part of the pillars, um, if we could go back to the previous slide, please. Um, so part of the four pillars and the foundation of L4 um, is our life enrichment um, experience and really making sure that um, our residents are going into the community, but also the community is coming into Balfour and that we are helping empower our residents to live their fullest life. Um, and that's through um, not only within our community, but um, through the external community. Um, we're offering art classes and music and concerts and educational opportunities and partnerships with universities um, and exercise classes and travel. And so one of the differentiators um, of Balfour is that we are not a cookie cutter community. We really look at the community in which we operate. Um, and so we have basic pillars and expectations of our communities, um, but each one of our communities, um, we really look to our residents and their families to help us create the culture within our community. The second pillar of Balfour is the culinary experience. And what we do is um, at Balfour, we hire an executive chef as well as a sous chef. Um, who get to know our residents and their palate and experiences. They also partner with local purveyors um, and farms to create a fresh menu by the season, um, as well as having designated wait staff. The third pillar of Balfour is our complimentary transportation program. Um, transportation is something that is offered at all senior living communities, um, but at Balfour we have a fleet of Teslas and um, um, and drivers who take the residents to um, different places, but most communities only offer services for medical appointments at Balfour. We want to encourage our residents to go and get their hair and nails done. Um, they can get it done in the community, but we encourage them to go and have meals with their families um, and really engage in the life um, of the community in which Balfour is, is located. Um, and the fourth pillar of, of Balfour is the continuum of care that we offer. Um, you will hear many Balfour um, residents and their families or associates refer to Balfour as a family. And um, it is really important that we offer a continuum of care. Um, we do that internally by offering 24-hour licensed nursing care. Um, but in addition, we partner with ancillary providers, whether it's a dentist, a podiatrist, an audiologist, or even therapy services, um, to really encourage and allow our residents to live their fullest life and to be able to allow them to benefit um, as part of um, our experience, the Balfour lifestyle. Next slide, please. Part of the way we do that is we are very committed at Balfour to our design. Um, we have award-winning interiors, and that is really important in creating the community um, that differentiates Balfour. And we want our residents to be proud of the community that they live in. We want them to invite their friends and family to join them for meals, to join them for a Mother's Day breakfast um, or brunch. And we do that 
um, by creating beauty and elegance of a fine resort um, while, while also creating a home-like essence. Um, through high ceilings, abundant lighting, colorful interiors, um, Michael's wife is an attorney by training, um, but Susan does all of our design. Um, and her team um, wins awards for that, but it is really important that our residents are surrounded by beautiful interiors to help create a platform for the community in which we um, serve our residents and our associates can serve. Um, and then lastly, um, it is really important that our com communities are sustainable. Um, that is a directive directly from Michael and a passion and something that's really important to him. Um, so the fleet of Teslas that we have um, are zero emission uh, vehicles. Um, as well as all of our communities participate in um, recycling and repurposing, um, and Belfort at Needham would be LEED Gold certified. And the last slide that we have is just to give you um, some examples and pictures of actual Belfort communities um, and our assisted living communities and to show the community that we can create from the architecture. Um, and Susan and the design team and the architect firms that we work with really look at the community that the Bell for um, the local community and try to mirror that um, so that we can then create a community for our residents and associates. Thank you, Julie. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Liz Peabody from the architectural team to speak next. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Liz Peabody. I work for the architectural team, like Evans just said. Um, thank you for the opportunity to represent this project. I know you're all very familiar with this um, in, in respect of everyone's time. I'm gonna try to focus my comments on the changes and improvements that we feel that we've made. If at any point you want me to slow down and talk in more detail about anything, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So here we have our ground floor. Um, it may look uh, quite similar, but there are some key differences that I'm gonna hit on. Obviously, as we've talked about at the beginning, the program has been streamlined from IL, AL, and memory care to just AL and memory care. Uh, and there are some benefits that the residents at this community are going to be able to enjoy that they wouldn't have been able to previously. Um, first and foremost is that all of the amenity space that you see here will be able to be enjoyed, well, I, so there's memory care on one side and A on the other, but all of the amenity space that IL previously had you know, segmented off from AL will now be able to be enjoyed by all of the residents um, in the AL community. So they'll have almost double the amount of amenity space than they would have under the previous application, um, which we think is gonna be really exciting for them. There's a lot more space for them to enjoy. Um, Starting at the entry, we've upgraded the entry sequence. Uh, this is now enclosed and enlarged a little bit. This is where the valet station and um, carts for move-ins and things like that will be. Previously, it had been proposed to just leave the entry as is, uh, which did not have the enclosure that, and we'll look at that a little bit more when we get to the elevations. Um, you can also come in and you're not directly confronted by that elevator. Um, if for anyone who's been to the site knows, you walk in and you're immediately maybe 10 feet in front of you, there's a solid wall and there's no view anywhere. Um, previously that was going to remain. Now we're relocating those elevators and you're gonna have this nice wide view corridor all the way across the hallway. And then when you turn immediately to your left, you're gonna have these beautiful double height spaces similar to the images that you just saw, um, which is gonna have a big wow moment um, and really open up that space and have a great airy, light atmosphere, which we feel is very important. Um, additionally, these two double height spaces, which you can see I'm pointing to with my mouse, hopefully everyone on the presentation can see my mouse, um, there is a direct connection to this courtyard. Um, so these areas are really gonna be the flagship lifestyle spaces for the residents to enjoy. Um, on the AL side, and I will let Ben, during his presentation, explain the courtyards a little bit in more detail. Uh, memory care programming, which is on this bar portion, is very, very similar to what was previously presented. Uh, we have consolidated the amenity spaces uh, more centrally, and allows us. this allows us to, again, have this direct indoor-outdoor connection with the memory care uh, amenity and outdoor courtyard which we feel is incredibly important. Um, previously, the memory care courtyard was over out on West Street. 
Um, we feel, we're really excited about this. We feel like this is a big improvement. Um, and again, Ben will speak to this a little bit more further in the presentation. Can I just interrupt and ask you what the Jockey Club is? Sure, so Jockey Club and Great Room are kind of a themed flagship. It's, it's like a lounge. Um, there's gonna be a bar, um, place for people to gather with their families, you know, grab a quick bite, that kind of thing. Um, Michael, if you want to expand on what a jockey club is to you, but to me it's just an exciting, lively lounge space for your residents. Susan spent some time in the various water holes of Washington, D.C., <laughs> and the, um, one of the hotels, long before I ever met her, uh, she would spend time and had a, a jockey club that was festooned with... Um, paraphernalia from the Washington, D.C. equestrian centers and the rest. Okay. So, there you go. More information than you probably wanted, <laughs> but I just needed an explanation of what the term meant. <laughs> there will not be horses here. <laughs> um, otherwise, the amenities are very similar. You have the pool, the fitness, um, things like that. Uh, upstairs, uh, you can see immediately these two white spaces right here. These are, um, or at least this one right here, is open to below. The one next one, the one next to it, will have a vaulted ceiling. But the open to below um, area, you'll get to experience that from the library. There's going to be this really nice grand staircase connecting the first and second levels um, and the the core amenity spaces for the residents, uh, which is going to be a big improvement. Um, over what was previously proposed. Just, just that, that volume of space really helps keep things open and airy. Um, we have a theater here as well as a crafts and activity studio. Uh, the other key point besides amenities that I wanna discuss is unit sizes. Uh, now that we are primarily AL and there's no longer an IL component, the unit sizes have been able to grow substantially and the average size is 830 with this Balfour proposal, which to me is a very typical apartment for standard market rate apartments as opposed to just senior living apartments. So that's a, it's a really healthy size. Whereas the LCB average was 622, which to me is more typical to an AL unit. Um, these larger units will have full-size kitchens, so the residents will have access to a full suite of kitchen appliances, and they will also have their own private washer dryer in their units, so for those who are healthy and active and have the ability to do so and desire to do so, they can do their own cooking if they wish, they can do their own laundry if they wish, but of course those amenities are also provided on site for those who want them. There's laundry service and obviously commercial kitchen and things like that. Full stove and, and um, oven? That's correct. Obviously memory care does not have a full kitchen, they just have you know their sink and locked fridge and that kind of thing. Correct. Level three, there's not a lot specific to talk about. It's very similar to what was proposed before. We have our commercial kitchen and our main dining up here. We have private dining for family functions. We have a bistro, a little grab and go station. Um, and then there's also plenty of spaces, you know, on this level and throughout for socialization, just kind of having a place to gather with friends in the community, with your family um, in these seating areas that you find in the center of the hallway. Uh, level four is the penthouse that we're adding, uh, and the biggest change, I think, from the LCB plan to what we're proposing right now is the elimination of the uh, amenity penthouse. So the impact to the street views and things like that will be less than the previous application. Uh, the penthouse that we are proposing has 11 units, each with their own individual terraces. Uh, very similar to what was proposed before, um, but the overall massing impact uh, has been reduced. Uh, this is a quick zoomed in view of the elevations. This slide is very similar to what was presented before because the elevation treatments are very similar. Uh, same materials are being proposed. There are some color changes just to provide some more contrast. Um, and then I also wanted to mention the windows. Under the previous application, the existing windows were proposed to remain. Um, as Julie mentioned earlier, we are going for LEED Gold certified, so upgrading the windows is going to be very important. We'll be replacing them with casement windows that have the appearance of double hung, so you still get that mill vibe and you're not really changing the character of the building so much, but you are getting a much higher performing window that you can't really get with a double hung. 
and we're proposing to change kind of the light pattern so that there's more light and less obstruction of the windows. Uh, and in, in addition to the high energy performance, they will also be high STC rated. We're well aware that there's a train basically right on site, and we want to make sure that the residents have a very acoustically sound, no pun intended, wall assembly uh, with great performing windows. We, we certainly don't want our residents complaining or being upset about the windows. We're very sensitive to that. We want to make sure that that's well addressed. Um, Will the windows open? Of course. Um, so I'm going to move through these next couple slides a little bit more quickly because they are so, so similar. Um, in this elevation, it's practically identical other than the removal of a couple of at-grade patios on Highland Ave. This is the Highland Ave elevation. The removal is just as a result of, you know, units shifting around with the redesign. These elevations are identical to what was proposed before other than the replacement of the windows. Here you can see the upgraded uh, entry that I spoke about previously. So the existing uh, overhang that's on site is gonna be removed and extended and replaced with um, this nice looking, very glassy uh, vestibule, um, which is gonna upgrade from the entry sequence like I mentioned. And then you're also gonna see, you can see at this lower elevation best, um, some very large double height windows that correspond to those two double height spaces I spoke about earlier. Go ahead. On the on the screen, mm -hmm. uh, the middle photo, yes. the uh, the uh, design feature towards the left mm -hmm. is that the entrance for memory care. Uh, great question. It is in the memory care wing. Uh, but it is not the entrance to the memory care. It's an AL direct entrance. So you get, you come in, there's a stair and elevators that go direct to AL. The memory care entry, if they, if they don't come through the main entry where the admin space is, there is a memory care entry on West Street. So what is that design feature? That design feature is existing. It's the port push air as you go, let me go back to the main plan. It's this guy right here. Okay. And the entrance for assisted living, oh, it's, sorry, for assisted living would be farther. Um, so assisted living it is right through here. So if you come in, there's a stair that goes upstairs and an elevator that the AL residents would have free and clear access to. Memory care does not have access to those stairs or elevators. So around the roundabout, that's no longer going to be the main entrance. Or that's not going to be even central. This is the main entrance for the property, but if you are a resident and you're not going to the amenity spaces, you're going straight to your units, this might be a far more efficient way to get in. So there are, there are two entries. This is dedicated to AL, and this is the main entry for the total property. I'm sorry, where is, where is the memory care on that floor plan? Right. So where are those units? Here, this is the dividing wall. Right. So there's controlled access from inside the building. So yes. the main entry is likely to be used by family um, and, well, family coming to visit is likely going to use the main entrance. This is controlled entry. And then there is also access to memory care on this elevation. So that whole section is all um, uh, memory care. Correct. But did you just say that the assisted living entry for the residents is... Uh, Let me see if I can zoom in. That's going to help a lot. So do you see how this is cut off and there's no access from this vestibule to this wing? It is only direct access straight upstairs. I see. Okay. It's going to, so because in. this building is so large, having only one entry for your AL residence is going to be really inconvenient. So we have two entries. There's your main entry where all the amenities are and then this entry right here. This is where the residents, so there are two Correct. entries for the assisted living residents. Correct. One is where the families would tend to greet, yes. and the other is uh, you're and all out and about. You're you're coming and going. And what I see here, where it says studio and one bedroom and den on either side, that's all memory care. Those are all memory care on units. On level one, yes. So you come in from the driveway. Here's your access to go straight up if you are an AL resident. If you are a memory care resident, you cannot use this entrance. You are there's just it's not. That's not a secure Accessible. entrance for you to use. Yes. Okay. And so all of these studios are memory care, correct? The, the memory care units 
Adam are all on the ground. First floor, that's what I, that's what I thought. Yes. Uh, but I was unclear with how that layout was presented, but now I have clarity, so thank okay. you for answering my questions. You're welcome. Okay, let me get back to presentation mode. No, that is a great question. It is a little bit in plan confusing because AL is in the memory care wing on the first floor only. So that's what that is. Um, and so to pick up where I left off, we were talking about the upgraded windows. So these much larger glassy, um, nice looking windows, this is gonna help foster that inside outside connection that we feel is really important. Uh, and it's gonna help differenti differentiate visually between amenity spaces versus residential spaces. Whereas previously, all of the amenity spaces from the outside and from the inside were gonna appear just the same as your own units. Um, so we feel that this is a, a nice improvement um, and is also not gonna be really visible for the street, is really you know, for our residents to enjoy. Because that's the side that faces the parking lot. Correct, yes. that's the parking lot facing side. Uh, this is the proposed south belt elevation. This is facing the other parking lot on the other side of the building. Um, practically identical to what was proposed before. Again, some patios were moved around because the units moved around inside. And then I think these have been presented to you before. Very quickly, just showing the difference between the two. You can barely see the penthouse uh, from Highland Ave at all. Um, and this is you know, showing there is gonna be a substantial investment in the landscaping, which Ben will talk about in a few moments. Um, again, another view from Highland Ave. Now that the amenity penthouse is gone, there's almost no visual access to this additional fourth floor. There's the penthouse from Mellon Street. And with that, that is the end of the architectural presentation. Um, before I turn it over to Ben, did you have other questions that I could answer? I'll ask uh, at this time, I guess, um, if uh, Artie or uh, Gene, if either of you have any questions at this point on the architectural before we move on to the next guest. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I saw it on the plans, uh, but it wasn't um, mentioned um, just now in the presentation that there is an entrance off um, Highland Avenue. Could that be shown? That's true. Sure. Okay, so I take it uh, residents of the, um, um, my sister living uh, uh, can enter from Highland Avenue if they wish to do so. Yes, we don't anticipate that this would be a primary entrance, however, yes, it is available to them. Okay, and uh, I, I don't know if, if you're the one to ask about, because um, you are the operating officer, so perhaps you do know um, these questions. Um, you mentioned that there will be full kitchens in each unit of the um, assisted living. Um, and uh, what will the basic charge include? Um, is the basic charge to live there, uh, does it include meals or is that extra? And also use of amenities such as fitness and pool. Is that included in the basic charge? Uh, I, let, let me address that. Yes, meals will be included, and most amenities, except for special events like going to th a th outside theater or musical event, will also be included. So uh, meals, you mean three meals a day? are included in the basic charge. Julie, you want to? That is, that is correct. Residents um, will have access to three meals a day um, that are chef prepared meals, and that's a regulatory requirement for an assisted living. And it so is. they can to come to the meal or not, um, but they, they will have access to three meals with open what? dining. Well, being of Scottish descent, I know if I lived there and I was paying for the meals, I would go and eat every one. <laughs> but I wouldn't be too happy about it. 
Well, uh, at, the, at the risk of presenting perhaps some conflicting information, my understanding was that the regulatory requirement is one meal a day and that the expectation was that we were going to be offering different meal plans. So the minimum that the, you are required in order to be licensed as a AL facility in Massachusetts is one meal. That will be included mm -hmm. in the base price. You can pay more for more meals than one meal per day. That's my understanding of what the intention is. Is that correct? And is, is that Michael speaking? No, this is Evans Huber speaking. But I, I, I believe I misspoke. That, um, and we can validate this. Um, but um, there will be um, three meals prepared. Uh, I think under Massachusetts regulations, um, one may be required, but we can validate that. Colorado is different, okay. but different states um, different are different. We do not send the police out to enforce, you know, that somebody must attend every meal or they're in trouble. <laughs> but it does. So but it's, it's, similar, it's similar to North Hill in that regard. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with North Hill to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the, based on what was presented, um, that's uh, my comment. So to be so so, so to be clear, um, the residents will have a, a full kitchen. Correct. And so, if they choose to cook their own meals, they aren't paying for three meals a day if they don't want to. They because would be paying for one meal a day. They, they, they could be paying for one meal a day and choose to make their own meals because they have full kitchens for the other two meals every day. But if they want to avail themselves of two meals a day or three meals a day, they can add to their basic charge. That's correct. In order to, we, to, we, to, to have that. We can certainly confirm that to you in writing. But no, I that's think that's our intention. No, that, that's fine. Thank you. Artie, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, so just to clarify the differentiation between assisted living and independent living, to some degree we're talking about that one meal per day. Is that a fair assessment? The difference if someone has assisted living versus independent living? That one meal being charged at this point? No, that's, I, 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 I would not agree with that, uh, Artie. Um, so the reason that it's important um, one of the reasons why it's important and why Balfour has taken the approach of having all of these rooms be, all of the apartments be licensed as AL facilities is that allows um, Balfour to provide services um, to a resident in an AL licensed unit, uh, you know, healthcare um, and assistance of daily living. Um, where they would not be able to do so if it was an IL unit. So if it was an IL unit and the resident of the IL unit needed care, they would have to bring that care in from outside. Uh, so the, uh, one of the, this is what Balfour refers to as aging in place. Um, mm -hmm. when, if you are living in a unit that is licensed as assisted living, you may not need any assistance when you first move in. Hopefully you won't. Uh, or maybe one member of the couple, if it's a couple, needs it and the other does not. Um, and so that, that, that care can be provided to you when you need it, either right away when you move in or when you eventually need it, without having to move from an independent living unit to an assisted living unit. Okay, so let me just clarify the other direction. Um, so you're saying legally you are not even allowed is that what you I just want to say so legally you're not even to, you're not allowed to even offer them services if it is an independent living unit? Is that what you're telling? Is that what you're saying? You're not even allowed to offer those services? Well, Julie can speak to that probably better than I can, but my understanding is if you are licensed as an assisted living facility or those units which are licensed as assisted living, the operating entity uh, in this case, Balfour, can provide the sorts of services that a resident needs, um, you know, assistance of, with activities of daily living, for example. Balfour would not be licensed to provide that care to somebody living in an independent living unit. Many people live in independent living units and find themselves needing assistance. And what typically happens in that situation is they either move 
to an assisted living unit, or they bring in care from the outside. I, I would also add that couples sometimes are a different uh, health status. And if one of the um, members of the household needs more care um, in an independent living, they can't provide that. That means that couples may have to split up. In this setting, they can stay in that, and one can receive the extra care, and the other one does not. Artie, uh, I, I understand. Yes. Do you have any questions about the architectural Thank and you. the site plan that was just presented? Because I, I, you've got other questions. We'll get to those questions, but I'm just mindful. Uh, let, let me just fairness. Okay, so I just okay. So I, I do have a question related to architecture. Thank you, Aaron. So I just want to be clear that so if you're just saying legally you're not allowed to offer those same amenities to the independent living that you do to the assisted living. I just want to clarify that's what you're saying. I, I, I wouldn't and, phrase it as not allowed. I would phrase it as we're not licensed to, to offer it in, facil in, in in units that are not licensed as assisted living facility. So an, a unit okay. could be an independent living unit, and in that unit, you are not licensed to provide services. Okay. Uh, just, the, uh, just to clarify, like, um, I just wasn't 100% certain where I mean, where is the entrance for the memory care? Is it the dual entrance of that where we we could also entrance for assisted living, plus the memory care does enter there as well? I just wasn't sure where the exact sure. entrance so, is for the memory care. So for those, I mean, a person living in memory care is not you know freely wandering in and out of this building, right? Um, so the sure. main the main well, entrance for the property, including for memory care, is here at this roundabout. There is also okay an entry on West Street. This is not the for primary the, entrance. The, for, for the memory care. For the memory care, correct. There's no access to AL from the West Street entrance. It's memory care only. OK, thank you. Uh, the other is, you're talking about the windows. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's fabulous that you're looking at gold standard. I mean, I, I, love, I, I love that you're doing that. I mean, you're talking about the windows would open now. What about the windows in the memory care units? Uh, do, did they all open the same way? And in, in if they all look in the same way, does that mean it offers the same accessibility out of the building? So um, that's I'm a great sure. question. Um, I don't know the precise answer to that, but my expectation is that the windows are opened in a very limited fashion in the memory care units. They don't have wide open, you know, they can't crawl through their windows. My expectation is that it's a four inch stop limit um, to the window openings. Julie, I see you nodding. Do you have any more to add on what is typical for a Balfour property? Yeah, that, that's exactly what you do. We, we typically in Colorado do a three inch stopper um, and it limits the window to only open three inches, um, but we would look at the, reg the life safety regulations in the state of Massachusetts. But, but, but there would be a difference between the opening and the memory care, how much they open, and the assisted living, how much they open, it would, it would be different? Correct, so for a standard unit in assisted living, you would be able to open the window a typical amount or you would be able to limit it um, if that person chose to limit it or if for some reason that was appropriate for that resident. Um, so yes, you would be able to have a more open window in an assisted living unit. Thank you, just the only other thing is, you're talking about gold, uh, gold standard. Um, were you putting solar on this building? That is not in the scope at this point. Um, we have gone through our scorecard for lead for the project and we're actually in great shape. We're a little bit over the limit um, for lead with our proposed scope of work, but no, at this point, solar is not going to be included. Well, no, I understand. I am seeing the measurement factors getting to the ego. Just if the roof space allows it, I, it would be a shame not to, not to have a key. I think outside. that the existing structure would probably need to be reinforced substantially in order to support that, um, which would be a pretty big added cost, but it is something I can keep in mind. Um, I do appreciate the comment. <laughs> Thank you. That's all we have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Artie. At this time, I'd ask um, Ben, ben, we'll ben to continue, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, once again, Ben LaFrance with Hawk Design. We're the landscape architects on this project. We were part of the uh, previous application as well. Um, by and large, the, uh, the plant palette for the property remains consistent with the uh, previous application. The approved plant species and proposed sizes all remain uh, very consistent with that application. Um, 
the uh, there have been small adjustments made uh, throughout the property to accommodate some of the architectural changes uh, that you just heard about, as well as some of the exterior resident amenities that we uh, that we were able to relocate based upon some of the interior programming of the building. Um, so along the Highland Avenue facade um, and the southern parking area facade, very minor adjustments were made to the locations of plantings. Uh, some, some areas we had to add or fill in some plantings based upon the resident patios uh, changing along there as well as some of the, the refinements to the door and window locations. Um, but a very lush setting along Highland Avenue. We have uh, street trees located along the building uh, as well as lower ground plane plantings creating a setting for the building. Uh, reducing the scale of the building and also creating interest for not only our residents but the town as well. Uh, at the north end of the building, pro probably one of the, the more noticeable uh, changes to the plan has been the removal of the memory care courtyard uh, along West Street. That's been relocated uh, further inbound in the site uh, adjacent to the library and dining area for memory care residents. Uh, if you recall, that memory care courtyard had an eight-foot-high fence around it, um, so that's been relocated, allowing us to, to create a much better landscape treatment along West Street. Uh, we're going to continue uh, the fence. There's an existing uh, black metal fence along there, wrought iron style fence with brick columns. Those are going to remain, um, and we've added or continued the landscape treatment that we previously had along there. Um, also, we have a connection walkway into our site uh, and a small seating terrace out there for our residents to enjoy. Um, certainly, the assisted living residents could go out there and sit, uh, have a cup of coffee and watch the traffic go by and things like that. So that's at the corner. What you're referring to on West Street is accessible in particular for assisted living residents and not memory care. Memory care is exterior access and amenity space is in yep. the middle of in the middle of the area. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. So, moving south along the uh, along the building facade there, uh, no changes to the plantings have been made or the sidewalks along there. Uh, if you recall, we have a meandering pathway um, inbound from the parking area that kind of winds through there, a few seating areas along the way for our residents to enjoy. Um, and then we get to the area south of the assisted living entrance that we just talked about. That is where our memory care courtyard has been relocated to. Um, that's adjacent to the interior library and dining area uh, of the residents. For the memory care, uh, we have a, a walkway that circulates and connects both of the entrances to the building there. Along the way, we have a water feature, several seating areas, as well as a shade pergola um, to shade the strong summer sun. The courtyard's also, uh, as was uh, in the previous application, uh, surrounded by an eight foot high uh, board fence. It would be a cedar fence, so very natural looking fence. That's part of the requirements of the memory care uh, facility to, uh, to enclose that space. Uh, we have plantings that would surround that, so it would really create a, a nice buffer of the fence there um, and all non-toxic plants within there um, to meet the guidelines of a memory care courtyard. Moving south of the service area, uh, we have an extension of the jockey club to an exterior courtyard there. A uh, nice place to extend the gatherings and comings and goings in the jockey club. The centerpiece of that will be a fireplace uh, that will extend the seasons into the shoulder seasons, create a nice ambiance uh, in the early evenings. That fireplace is flanked by two shade structures. Um, once again, creating a, sh a seating area that will shade uh, people from a strong summer sun. There's multiple areas in there that will act as seating, uh, small conversation areas for our residents to go outside and enjoy the fresh air. Uh, in the circle uh, in front of the main entrance uh, to the building, the centerpiece of that will be a commissioned uh, sculpture piece. Uh, we really see that as a focal point as you drive in uh, and down the main entrance there that will really pull one in their vehicle to that entrance, sort of signifying that there is something important down there. Uh, we've also created a connection to that circle um, by continuing the paving across the drop-off area and out to that space. There is a uh, 
there's a walkway that surrounds that area with several options for benches there for residents to go out and sit and enjoy. Look at the sculpture and see the cars coming and going in there. Next slide, please. Um, for the lighting plan, uh, we are proposing all new fixtures on the property. Um, Due to the efficiency of this newly proposed site light fixture that we have, we were able to reduce the number of, of lights from 31 on the previous application to 26 on this current application. Uh, the proposed lights will be an LED fixture. They're gonna be fully dark sky compliant um, with backside shields where appropriate to, uh, to eliminate any light spillage off the property. Um, lights have been reduced in height from 16 to 14 feet, so they bring down a little bit in height, a little bit more pedestrian friendly uh, height to those. Uh, and additionally, light bollards uh, on the property have been reduced in quantity from 28 to 15, largely due to the reconfiguration of, of the resident courtyards that we just reviewed. So with that, I could certainly answer any questions or I can turn it over to traffic. Uh, Aaron at the other end there. Good evening, Erin um, Fredette with McMahon Associates, traffic engineers on the project. Um, in the interest of time, I'll give a very brief overview, but I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Um, so for the proposed Belfour project, we conducted a updated traffic assessment, which primarily focused on a comparison between the proposed Belfour project to the previous LCB project. Um, if you recall, as part of the LCB project, we performed a full traffic impact study looking at the adjacent roadways and intersections to the project site as well as the project site driveways. And we really wanted to focus on the comparison because the findings of that traffic impact study indicated a <coughs> Um, that there was no projected impact um, associated with the proposed LCB project. And so one of the things that we focused on as part of the assessment was looking at trip generation, which is how many trips would be generated by the proposed Balfour project. And based on the updated build program of all assisted living, um, the trip generation during the weekday morning peak hour and the weekday afternoon peak hours was shown to be nearly identical. So we're looking at about 30 trips during the weekday morning peak hour and about 45 trips during the weekday afternoon peak hour. Um, we also looked at parking for the proposed Balfour project. Uh, the proposed project would uh, provide 145 on-site parking spaces. Uh, we reviewed uh, peak period parking demand utilizing the Institute of Transportation Engineers um, parking generation manual, which is industry standard. Um, and that projection indicated a uh, peak demand of about 60 parking spaces, so the 145 should well serve that, that peak demand. Um, and additionally, there would be no changes to the site access um, from either the, senior, the, the LCB senior living proposal or from really the existing access. Um, and so based on the previous findings of the traffic impact study that indicated no significant impact to the adjacent roadways and the very comparable trip generating characteristics, the ability to serve um, projected parking demand on site and no additional changes to the um, proposed site driveways, um, the proposed Balfour at Needham project would also follow um, the same findings and, and not be expected to have a significant impact on the adjacent roadways and intersections. So. Unless there's questions, I can turn it over to David Kelly. It, it was not a, because we're trying to keep our presentation within certain time limits, which we've exceeded. Uh, uh, we were not planning to have Mr. Kelly uh, uh, make any sort of a presentation. Um, our expectation is that with certain limited exceptions that I referred to about the, uh, you know, the parking stalls in the underground, uh, in the enclosed garage. Um, you know, we meet, as you're looking at these zoning tables, we meet zoning compliance with uh, virtually every requirement. And so Mr. Kelly is available if you have engineering or site plan questions, but that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we will get to uh, uh, an opportunity for the public to participate. Before that, uh, there will be an opportunity for planning board members uh, but before we get to the planning board members, uh, additional comments and questions at this time, for the record, I would like to um, uh, note the following comments on this application from town staff and departments. Artie, I see your hand is up, but I will get to you after. Um, we have received uh, an email uh, from the building commissioner, Dave Roach, who said, uh, dated July 15th, uh, that he is satisfied with the current plan. 
We have a letter from our town engineer, uh, Tom Ryder, dated August uh, 10, recommending stormwater recharge on site in order to minimize future disruption. Uh, he acknowledges uh, that it's uh, not required, yet he suggests that to do it would be substantially advantageous. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment with our questions. Um, we have an email dated from August 10 from Assistant Public Health Director Tara Gurge, who notes that obviously a food permit will be required, a pool permit will be required, uh, sufficient, um, she's also looking for a sufficient space in the parking lot for a trash dumpster, a separate recycling dumpster, and also a containment program for waste oil and grease. Um, a pest control service contract to be in place during construction, in addition to post-construction, in addition to a potential uh, requirement for wildlife pest services uh, contract uh, during and post-construction. Um, we have an email dated August 11 from our new fire chief. Excuse me, yes. Anna, may I interrupt there because I yes. have a comment about Tara Gurge's email? Sure. Or it's kind of a question. Yep. Um, she also stated that the dumpsters must be placed in an easily accessible area close to the main kitchen areas. And I noted that the kitchens are on the third floor. And so I was wondering if you address that issue with the health department about the fact that that, we'll have to open that, the that they want to see <laughs> they want to see the dumpsters they want to see the dumpsters close to the kitchen and yet I think that's a little bit difficult if the kitchen's on the third floor. That's a great point. So let me address that or do you want to continue or should I address that now? Uh, you, you can address it now briefly. briefly. Otherwise just uh, you know uh, you know it's, it's a note that will have to be addressed. I'm sure Evans you've seen all of the town public comments right. and you know we'll, we're looking to address those in addition you know to the comment that Tom Reiner had made but so there right. is a service elevator here that is not intended primarily for resident use. This is for uh, kitchen staff and things like this. Um, here's your service for the memory care dining. As you can see, it leads right out to the dumpster. Um, and then if you go up, pardon me. Uh, you can see this commercial kitchen has direct access to this elevator, which leads you right to the dumpsters on the first floor. And the residents don't have access to that elevator. Correct. And, and have you discussed this with Ms. Gurge? We have not had direct conversations, no, but I do feel that this is the closest connection we could I, possibly achieve. Yeah, I, I would like to see something from Ms. Gurge indicating that she's okay with this. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we have an email uh, uh, dated August 11 from our new fire chief, Tom Conroy, uh, who is satisfied. We have an email on August the 12th from uh, police chief um, uh, Schlittler, who has no issues. Uh, we also have a memo dated June 21st from the design review board, having uh, acknowledged um, the changes made from the previous application and the previous program to the current program. Um, and uh, they have no further issues. Um, uh, I have a, a couple of comments uh, and, and questions. Um, uh, I want to make it. I want to make a note that we, uh, that you will have an opportunity to speak with uh, our public health department to ensure, as my colleague Paul Elpert has said, an opportunity to satisfy her comment with uh, access to the dumpster, in addition to her other. Uh, comments about uh, uh, the placement of the dumpster, both dumpsters, and uh, the containment program for grease oil, um, uh, for waste oil in Greece. Um, I, and also um, with your engineer to, uh, you know, to discuss with Tom Ryder, the, you know, the opportunity that we have now, while the building will be under renovation, to address on-site stormwater management uh, or discharge, um, you know, as opposed to um, addressing that in the future. Um, 
uh, for uh, for Mr. Schonbrunn, uh, you had mentioned that I think this program, if I recall, uh, has 127 assisted uh, living units. I think that's roughly the program. Um, and you're intending, uh, are you, you're not only intending to admit seniors that require assistance with living, is that correct? That's correct. And you therefore will admit some uh, um, residents who are able to live entirely independently, regardless of the fact whether they're Scottish or any from any other <laughs> nationality, have the uh, ability to, you know, pay for uh, one meal a day that they're otherwise fully independent. Yes, that's okay. correct, and it's what we've done in several of our other buildings that um, offer the three really programs. So, um, do you have any idea how many of those, you, of the 127 units that you kind of hold as available for residents that are able to live fully independently? I'm not sure that we hold them available, but I believe that in, um, Julie, and you can help, I think we're sub, somewhere around 30% uh, in our, for instance, our Longmont who um, are living independently. In, yeah, in Long last time I came there's there's 68 living apartments and 24 of the residents are currently considered independent, meaning they have no care needs at all. That's helpful. So if of 127 units, 30% is roughly somewhere less than 45. Do we have an ability here to accommodate some affordability, 12.5% of uh, um, uh, 45 units would be more than 10% uh, uh, would be uh, five, um, so six units to hold as affordable? Well, that has not been our proposal. Um, people's needs change. The average age around the United States of folks living in independent living versus those living in assisted living is roughly 18 months. So the length of stay will determine as, if they are with us for the rest of their lives, which is certainly our intention, that they will need that care over time. And rather than have to move to a different location, we think the advantage of this program, where it's all licensed assisted, they can remain there and, and therefore one unit, one year might be somebody living independently. The next year that may change and they would need more care. They will not have to move. And the same thing, of course, happens to... Uh, I wasn't thinking of actually of, of requiring moving of a resident. And I understand that you have that license, but if there's an opportunity, I do wonder, and I want to give some thought to, if you're dealing with somewhere around 30% and there's an opportunity to make affordable within the existing license structure where they're not paying extra for additional living, assisted living services, that there might be some accommodation for those six units or so. Well, my well, I, think, I, yes. think the, I think the problem with what you're suggesting is that um, this, I think, is a, a problem inherent in the requirement that so independent living units have uh, an affordable component is that at the time when the, the resident of that unit whether it's an independent living unit or a, is that me? I don't know. But if the feedback ghost is gone, so please continue. Uh, whether it's a, a resident of a, of a affordable, capital A affordable unit, or a resident of a, of a assisted living unit that doesn't require any, any additional care, is that the day will come when that person needs care, and then if the person, you know, can't afford that care, and they're because they're in there on an afford, you know, an affordable basis, and now what do you do? Do you ask them to leave? So, 
it's it's a it's a very difficult um, reality to, I just mean, to address the fact that virtually just, everyone who lives in this building is going to need care at some point. I, I understand that, and I'm not suggesting that they would have to move out. Or that I, what I am suggesting is that there may be an opportunity. That's just something that I want to c consider, and I'm going to um, you know, open this up for my other uh, colleagues. Um, but it's just something to consider that until such a time that someone requires additional services, for which they pay obviously an additional fee, that they that they may have uh, they may have a, a benefit of some affordability program. Well, I guess I would respond to that by saying, as far and away the greatest motivation on our part to make a contribution of the size that we have agreed in principle I understand. It is as a donation to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in recognition of the fact that this assisted living is not required by the bylaw to have affordable and uh, there are difficulties in implementing an affordable program for assisted living and so uh, because you know, assisted living can cover a, a range of, of levels of care and therefore a range of costs. And so, um, you know, it's not an inconsequential amount of money, $1.9 million. You know, that was intended to, it, it, you know, if the town, the town can use that money however they want. And if they want to use it to provide some sort of a subsidy to people that they determine are eligible in some way, that's certainly the town's prerogative, but it was not our intention to do both, for sure. I, I understand it wasn't your intention to do both. I'm just trying to identify other, um, you, know, you know, other opportunities here, which is the purpose for the questions. But we can, you know, we can. I think speak a little bit to the right? Please. But then, uh, I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone so people at home can hear you as well. And if you could say your name, please. My name well. is Patrick Bennett. I'm with Weltower. Um, I think one of the, just to help provide some context into uh, this question is, the 30%, I think you alluded to it as well, it's, it's going to be fluctuating, right? If people, it could be 50% at the beginning, it might move to 20% at some point, because once people will require care, that we, we, it's hard to predict when they will require care. Um, the way this works, we Typically, I think as a company, can tell you, we don't. There's barely any profit margin for care. It's like not the way we operate. It's not the way we want to operate. So, the moment that we start um, providing a lot of care to an affordable, as a to a resident that is in, in an affordable housing unit, what will what will happen is that the impact of having an affordable housing unit um, on site, someone requires a lot of care is financially very difficult to, uh, to say. That's, I'm not say suggesting that the affordable unit or the, or the, I'm not suggesting rather that the assisted component necessarily becomes affordable. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that. I am suggesting is that if there are, if there are up to 45 residents, mm -hmm. uh, 45 units of the 127 units that are for a period of time Generally speaking, not requiring additional assisted living services, they are cooking at least two of, of the three of their own meals themselves, um, walking, driving, participating independently in, uh, you know, in, in society. Um, Mr. Chair, yes. may, may I jump in here be, because I think you're getting into an area that I'm getting confused about and. I have some questions that maybe might provide some clarity okay. on this okay. issue. Can you explain how the fee structure works so that, for example, are all of the assisted living units paying the same fee? I, I recognize the fact that the fee will change based on how many meals you have, but are you charging different fees based on whether or not they need assisted living yes. care? Yes. Okay. So the assisted living care is available, and if you need it, you pay extra. Correct. And typically, we have folks at zero, one, two, and three levels of care, which are, in fact, calculated based on points and, and the needs that they may have. The okay. other thing, 
walls. The units are not all the same size, so. No, no, no. I, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand as, as, because the distinction that, that's being made here, is, a person or a couple who needs no care, versus, a person or a couple that needs care, and Adam's trying to get to, an affordable. Um, um, an affordable unit potential um, where the, the affordability clearly then, then depends upon the level of care that the people need. I mean, if, you know, that, that's, that, that changes the dynamic. The other thing that I want to mention for what this is worth, Mr. Chairman, um, part of the issue of our bylaw requiring affordable units is because we want to stay below the threshold for 40B. And I'm thinking, without looking it up, I'm thinking that we can have, we can require, or we can ask the applicant to, to agree to having some sort of subsidy or affordability for certain residents, but because they're not technically independent living units, I don't think that those affordable units would help right. us in terms of being part of the affordable units in town that would go to our maintaining 10 percent right. affordable right. units. Well, or, or, so, or the other side of that same coin is that's the reason that there is no requirement in the bylaw for affordability component of oh, assisted. assisted living, because assisted living does not count against the housing stock, which is the denominator of the ratio that has to be. Which is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which I, I understand that. I, just, I see there's a period of time. I see that there are, there's a potential for five units. And I think, Lee, in our underlying zoning, we were talking about may, there might be an opportunity for nine units. <laughs> I well, can't Adam, just, just to correct your math, by the way, and this, this is not, we just fundamentally don't agree with what you're proposing, but even if it was 30% of 120, 30% of 120 is not 45, it's about 37. Right. And so. 12.5% and and of that is 4.8, which is roughly rounded up to five units. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I recognize that, uh, I recognize that this is, not something that we had previously discussed. I recognize that this is new to you. I recognize that also that there is a period of time that there are, that the operation through its assisted living facility, I think we mentioned in Colorado, uh, has uh, uh, roughly 30% of those units are uh, not held. That was a, a, in a incorrect terminology, but uh, in, um, uh, those units are are effectively um, licensed as affordable units, and yet, uh, you mean sorry, I apologize, licensed as assisted living units, and yet have residents, bless you, that are not uh, that are living independently, and for that, if we can capture an opportunity where there is that period of time, that might be something that you know that might be something of interest. However. I, you know, I, I am mindful of the time. I was trying to, to wrap this up, bless you again, for roughly for 8.30, because we have another schedule that hearing that was supposed to commence at 7.45, and we haven't yet had a chance to get to other colleagues. Um, so at this time, what I'm going to do is ask Paul if you have any other comments or questions. Um, just on the thought that we've had, I have seen business models which we don't have here. But I have seen business models where part of the business model is to have some sort of subsidy for people who, who cannot afford uh, the, the full freight right. for, for what it costs. And, 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 and um, I'm just going to comment that um, it's clearly not the business model here, so we're asking them to substantially change their business model to have um, uh, some sort of affordability there, but also that they're negotiating with the select board right now on, 
on this particular issue. I mean, if they're making a substantial contribution to, to the town that goes to the town's um, affordable housing trust, um, that's, that's, I, that's the purpose of the negotiations is to, is to address I, that issue. I, I, I and I'm still waiting that. to see, you know, I look forward to seeing a final agreement. Yes. On yeah, that. There's, there's, you know, principals reach agreement and then the lawyers get involved and muck things up with verbiage. So. Yes, they do. <laughs> so, it says two lawyers in the room. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm mindful of that. I, I wanted to raise it because as we're having the presentation, I see that there is an opportunity. I wasn't sure if that opportunity had been explored. I want to explore it. That's just me. But Paul, do you have, separate no, from that, do you have I'm other comments, questions or comments? Uh, uh, Artie Crocker, uh, I see your yes. hand is up. Yeah, 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 thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, a couple of, couple of questions. Um, I'll get to my first one last related to what you're talking about, Mr. Chair. Uh, just re regarding the, the lights in the parking lot, um, obviously they're letting our dark sky complaint. What is being done to shroud the lights for actually entering the building. I know there's likely going to be something done to shroud the lights so not too much light, not too much light exit the property. What's being done to shroud them so to minimize how much light actually enters the building? I ask because there are people living in this building. So what has been done to mi mitigate that or minimize that? Sure. So. Um... Do you have a pro, do you have a profile profile of the lights of the light projection? Anything? So here you see we've we've located a predominance of the lighting uh, for the parking lot along the exterior edge of the parking lot there, so furthest away from uh, most of the residents. Um, you can see the photometry here of the lights uh, is very low as it gets towards the building. Additionally, bringing them down in height from 16 to 14 feet will get them uh, get down in relation to the resident units. So looking out of the second story uh, windows, they'll be lower uh, relative to the sill height. So that will also help mitigate some of the lighting uh, that might spill in. And then additionally, um, obviously window treatments and things like that will, will even impact that more and, and reduce that light. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question is, what, what allowance is has been made? My apologies if I missed it. What allowance has been made made for um, residents to have cars? And how many cars? How many units have cars and so forth? Is there any is there any allowance for that? And how much? Well, the, would you like to speak to that? Um, I mean. Well, from our perspective, we tend to use uh, industry standard data, so I don't want to speak to um, what Balfour may do. Well, I, I can say on the part of Balfour that uh, residents are welcome to have cars. Um, we have a very robust transportation program with uh, uh, essentially a car and driver who will take people as well as the um, proverbial uh, bus that will take outings. Um, <clears throat> typically, we have approximately uh, somewhere between a quarter and a half of our residents bring cars. And once they realize the benefits of the transportation program that Balfour provides, uh, half of those people will um, either never use them or get rid of their cars. So it's a very small um, percentage that are actually using it. But are, but are they, are, are they is, is every AL resident allowed to have a car, yes. one, one car, let's say? Or, yes. And, and if so, are they, are they charged extra for cars in the, in the parking lot? Uh, at, the, at this point, I'm not sure we we're, we're planning on the charge for the parking, but we have not refined all of the um, fees for the building yet. So I, I think I have to say I don't know. They certainly are allowed to bring a car if they want to. Except for the memory um, care folks that we hoped, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course for that one. Um, so again, getting into the uh, gold cert standard, uh, because I, I know with gold certification, there's a certain, you know, rainwater, you know, gray water reuse. Um, I don't remember right now, but the stormwater mitigation reuse. Could you talk about that? Could you talk about what the plans are for that? 
is rainwater, stormwater, rainwater reuse. Do we have who's from uh, from Kelly Engineering on the? Oh, we do. David, so David Good evening, on. Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so, so firstly, with regards to grey water, there has been no discussion, but there really isn't an appropriate way to deal with that here. Um, there really isn't grey water from a plumbing separation system. I'm not sure the town even allows it. Um, relative to storm drainage, we did just receive or just heard about the comment from Tom Ryder this evening regarding the suggestion for more recharge on site. I want to note, and I think in Tom Ryder's letter, which we haven't seen yet, he did note that the project does comply with their stormwater regulations, and it does because there isn't an increase in paved area on the site. We will look, based on that comment, with opportunities to enhance recharge on the site uh, for sure, but it's not that easy here because it's an existing storm drain system that ultimately drains across the railroad mm -hmm. to the west. Uh, but based on that comment, we, we certainly will look at it, you know, prior to the next hearing. What, what about what about rain rainwater basically hitting the roof surface and, and using that using that rainwater as a um, holding tank, watering the plants? I mean, is there anything being done with the rainwater itself on the property on the on the, the structure? There's no proposal for cisterns here. It would probably be difficult. There's a lot. Um, uh, uh, there's very little room to, to accommodate cisterns. Our experience with cisterns, which I think is what you're talking about, is that, um, is that they store water when you don't need it, and they don't store it when you do need it. You know, for instance, the last six weeks, obviously we had very little rain, which is really when you want the cistern, and, and those cisterns are empty. So we've looked at it on many, many projects and it, it really is not it really doesn't make sense again to the extent that the board feels we ought to look at it more we certainly can we don't have a lot of room the uh, the volume of water needed to be stored in order to um in order to be available when 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 you have um, at times without rainfall is very large and becomes really uneconomical um the well, well, presumably uh, i mean i'm just referring to even just using for you know, watering plants and such as that. I mean, so, so at this right. point, there's absolutely no, no reuse of any rainwater, stormwater. There's, there's nothing. And this is going to be gold certified. Well, but there's nothing, no reuse of any rainwater at all. You, it's a huge roof surface, but there's nothing. It's a reuse of an existing site, and that's why I, I don't believe under the lead requirements there's a requirement for it here, and there is no increase in impervious as we noted. Agreed. Um, but again, we, you know, We'll take the comment and, and certainly take a look at it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I won't talk about the plants right now. Um, and Mr. Chair, I just want to comment that I agree with um, what you're looking at. I mean, we have a problem here looking for a solution. And the problem being is, you know, what we saw as a town earlier, what we approved, voted on, and that was what we're seeing now. And, and so, we, again, we have a problem looking for a solution. And so, uh, you know, Paul, you had also mentioned that you had, you had seen some, um, some situations where they did provide some type of subsidy. I'll use the word affordable housing aspect, the affordable aspect of it, but something. So again, we have a problem looking for a solution. So I, I agree with bringing it up as a topic, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, uh, see that Jean McKnight has uh, her hand up. So Jean. Yes, I, I realize we've got to move on quickly. Um, I want to give an idea of what my comments are, but perhaps they won't be answered uh, at this meeting. Um, first of all, the assertion that uh, assisted living is a use that's allowed by right in the underlying district, I completely disagree with. The word that is in our zoning bylaw is a convalescent facility is allowed by right or a skilled nursing facility. And I think that it, word is one that perhaps was used in the past and in some places is used in the present to, to describe a rehab facility for people, you know, coming out of the hospital. Gene, uh, uh, Gene, let me, Gene, let me just give you a, a 30 second response so that you can maybe think about this between now and the next meeting. 
the reason that we say that it's allowed as of right is that if you look in the definition of assisted living in the bylaw, the definition of assisted living is a tight, it's a subset of a convalescent or nursing home under the town bylaws. So convalescent or nursing home as defined in the town bylaws includes assisted living. It I'll review that again, uh, but I did read it and that's the conclusion I came to. Um, but I, I will read it again. Well, again, the only other thing I would say Mr. is, Huber, we, Mr. Don't, Huber, we don't want to debate I this. Ju I, just, I, I understand you don't want to debate it. She's raised a comment. She's not looking to engage. She just wants to raise her comments. Fair enough. In the interest of time, I'd like uh, uh, the vice chair to continue. Jean? Yes. Um, I note that um, the traffic report indicates that the uh, level of accidents at the uh, intersection of West Street and Hillside Avenue is very high. It's higher than um, the state average for uh, unsignaled intersections. And I know that the town is expected to address that uh, with improvements. Uh, I'd like to find out what the timing is on those improvements and uh, whether, whether the amount of, uh, to be con contributed to the town should be boosted in some way uh, towards the cost of that. Um, although I do understand the traffic impact report says this uh, facility will not have a greater impact than the previous uh, use of the building and than the previous proposed use of the building. So I don't want to get into arguing that, but I throw it out. I, I guess I live on Hillside Avenue and I know how bad that intersection is, how dangerous it feels when you try to cross it as a pedestrian. Um, on the fiscal impact report, uh, one thing uh, it was said that uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if this was in the fiscal impact report, I think it might have been, that 40, uh, 35 to 40% of the uh, um, residents are expected to be people who were formerly residing in their own homes in Needham. And uh, I think one impact, it may be a welcome impact because it may be some of these are the smaller homes that might be sold to younger families, creating some opportunities for people to move into our community. Um, uh, you know, even our own children, you know. Um, but of course, uh, when families with, with children uh, move into um, Needham, there is an impact on the schools. So I think at least some consideration should be given to the fact that Needham families selling their house, moving here, will create uh, opportunities for families to move to our town with a school impact. Um, then um, I very much appreciate the discussion we've had with the cost structure. Um, I'm really focused, I've said, right along uh, at a pr prior meeting before the application was filed that I uh, prefer to see affordable units on site uh, rather than a compensation payment. And if there is a possibility of structuring five units, not the original nine, but five units based on the formulas we were discussing, and I point out too that five units is approximately half of the units, that are, of, of the penthouse units. And we don't have to allow that extra story like on this building. Um, but if the extra story is there, there's nine extra units, five is about half of that uh, to be affordable. Um, and, and with regard to that, you know, our, our nation is moving and our state is moving toward the idea. Uh, and I think funding will, and programs will eventually come along to maintain people, to maintain uh, people who have need, uh, assisted living needs in their own home. So if you have somebody living in a unit who would have to pay extra for the services, um, can't that person provide those services through some other program uh, and get them for themselves so they'd be all set living there and continuing to live there. Uh, I think that's definitely a possibility for the future. Another thing on landscaping details, I, re I reviewed the plans very carefully, but I couldn't find a legend 
that tells me, you know, that the plants show some plants, some trees is larger and some it's smaller and some some is pink. But I, uh, if there's a, um, a one of the plants that actually helps me know what those plants are, or Jean, later. Jean. We continue the hearing, and we can talk about that later. Jean, but, I'm, I'm just going to yes. I'm just going to mention uh, that um, Ben has uh, Ben might have an answer quick for you. Okay. Yes, Ms. McKnight, that's shown on sheet LD1, the plant schedule and planting details in the landscape. Oh, package. okay. L D is in David one. That's correct. All right, I'll look at that. Thank yep. you. There's, there's a plant um, schedule that shows quantities and, and proposed size. size. Okay, I, I somehow missed it. Um, I noted this enhanced stormwater discharge that was asked for. Um, yes, so um, I, I want to say also that I'm very pleased that our design review board an opportunity to review this and it is satisfied uh, with the, the plantings, the lighting, and also especially uh, the new arrangement for fencing at the corner of West Street and Highland. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that design review board is satisfied with. All right, those are my comments and questions, and uh, maybe address further later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. Um, I'd like to note for the record that we have received three written comments from the public on this subject. We received an email from uh, Andrew Hutland on August 9th expressing a preference for independent living units so such residents could make active use of, in particular, public transportation in comparison to a program that would, um, uh, that's uh, exclusively assisted living and memory care only units who may have a tendency of not utilizing uh, the immediate area amenities uh, to the same level. We received an email um, on August the 12th from the Board of Directors of the Village Club um, uh, in the, uh, almost across the street uh, in the cl a close proximity of uh, 100 West Street in support of the application. We've also received a note from uh, resident Joe Abruzzis, who's a town meeting member of 30 Bridal Trail dated August 8th. Uh, this, uh, uh, this note was also sent and addressed to the select board who was opposing the, uh, the change in program and the, at the time the then draft memorandum of understanding between the town and the applicant. Ordinarily at this time I would open the hearing up to the public for public comment. Um, uh, however, I note the time we're well past, we're almost at 8.45 our second hearing was scheduled for 7.45 this evening. So what I would Mr. like to do... Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm not sorry, Mr. Uh, Artie, Chair. Artie, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, okay? Artie, 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 I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna come to you in a minute, please. Uh, Alex, can you put up on the screen uh, the number of, uh, res the number of um, members of the public uh, so we can see who has their hand up? So we have, it's all filtering in now. I'd like to, us to take a note of, um, are you able to enlarge that so you can do a screen grab? Well, I'm not going to screen grab it, but I can see the picture. Okay, what's that? What's that? A woman is standing over here. I, I believe that she's with the applicant. So, um, are we able to take a screen grab or something? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, Mr. Chair, we have to allow the public to come. We have to, we have to allow the public to come. They've been waiting a long time, and, 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 the, and the presentation by the and presentation went went on quite a long time. I understand we have some we have some comments there, but it went quite a long time, much much over the time period. Artie, I understand that. I'm not denying the public an opportunity to speak. I hear what you're saying. Uh, and yet, if we have a motion to continue the hearing, then we can continue at that point and start, uh, and start, with, uh, uh, start with public comment, unless we start with addressing some of the, uh, the next hearing, some of the answers, some of the specific questions that may have come up. But otherwise, at this point, I would, I would entertain a motion 
to um, continue the hearing to September 20th at 7.45. So moved. We have a motion on the floor. Second. We have a second. Uh, any discussion? I, I just, I, to I totally disagree. I think we should at least have 15 minutes of public comment, and just at least 15 minutes of public comment. And I understand we're running along. I get that. I appreciate that. But they've been, they've been here for a long time, and listening to them for a long time now. We should at least allow 15 minutes of public comment, and then continue it, then continue the additional public comment. It is not, it is not fair that all these people are here at this point expecting to have public comment and they're having none. That's, that's not right. We should at least have 15 minutes of public comment. We can keep things brief and go that way, and then continue more later on. Um, Need bank is not going to take a long time. Right, I understand. Um, okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. If you'd like a response. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I think the public uh, it is not a waste of time by any means for the public to tune in to this meeting and to hear the presentation, and also to hear the planning board's comments and questions. And um, I think it's we have to be fair to the other applicant who's waiting to present tonight. And um, I think we want to make sure we, we uh, set aside a substantial amount of time at the uh, September 20th um, meeting to hear the public here on this. No, no, um, it was a waste of time. I'm saying it's not fair for the public to be I, here for this long. We shall at least allow 15 minutes, at least 15 minutes. I, 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 Artie, I understand what you're saying. I don't want to continue to, to waste further, further time talking about how much time we have. Uh, can you, uh, uh, Alex, can you scroll down a little bit so we can see how many more members we have with our hands up, our participants? Is it, is it seven at the top? There's seven. Okay, so uh, uh, Paul, would you like to withdraw your motion? Or now that we have a second, we actually have to come to the vote? I think we should. You should have a vote, but don't ask me first. <laughs> <laughs> you're alphabetically, you're in alphabetical I order. I think, I think what I, you know what, I think procedurally we have to go forward with the vote, and I think I know how this is going to go. So I ask my uh, colleagues uh, to. Uh, I, 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 I just want to comment that if there's anybody who wants to comment, who feels that they can't be here on September 20th, right. please give us your comments in writing. They will be read into the record. They will be part of the record. You don't need to verbally make your comments. I understand people like to do that, but... but um, uh, and that email address they can submit their written comments is planning at needhamma.gov. Needham, rather, planning at needhamma.gov. I appreciate that. I'm going to ca uh, call the roll. I am going to start with you. That's perfectly fine. Paul Alpert. Um, so the motion is to continue, and I'm going to vote aye. You're going to vote aye? Yes. Oh, okay. Artie Crocker. Uh, no. Uh, uh, Natasha Spada is not with us this evening. So Jean McKnight? Aye. Vote aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Uh, so the motion carries. We are continuing the hearing to um, uh, uh, September the 20th at 7.45. Lee, is that the correct date and time? Yes. Very good. Um, not how the vote I was expecting to go, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, that's where we are. I do appreciate that people have uh, participated tonight, that they, have, uh, that they have observed tonight, that they're participating in the process. I apologize that we have run out of time uh, this evening to, uh, to get to the public comment. We do look forward to picking this up uh, at, uh, on September 20th for public comment. Um, we thank the applicant uh, for, for coming this evening, for being here, for uh, all of the people on the applicant's team. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, very good. Mr. Chair, may I yes. ask for a five-minute break? Yes. Uh, uh, we stand in recess for five minutes.
We are back from recess. Uh, I now call to order our hearing that was originally scheduled for 7.45 uh, for an amendment to major project site plan special permit number 2012-04 with respect to an application from Needham Bank to modify existing mezzanine space and drive through bank operations at 1063 Great Plain Avenue. Uh, may I please have a motion to waive the notice of hearing? Mr. Chairman, I move that we waive the reading of the notice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, second. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I come to the vote uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, Paul Alpert. Aye. Artie Crocker. Aye. Uh, Jean McKnight. Aye. And the chair is aye. Uh, we apologize for keeping Nita Bank and your participants uh, waiting uh, for so long, and we are grateful for your patience. Thank you very much. We welcome you to come on up. Uh, and uh, who would like to lead off our presentation? I'll, I'll, I'll lead off. Uh, okay. So Derek Redgate, I'm a civil engineer with High, High Point Engineering. Uh, Jim White, um, official title. I'm the chief administrative officer at Nina Bank. At the bank, yeah. okay. And so I think how we'd like to, we have some folks on, on Do, Zoom. Yeah, I just want to make sure, well. I just also want to make sure for the record that, um, that we also have uh, Derek. Is he participating remotely? That's me. That's you. That's me, You're in Derek, person. Derek Redgate. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and uh, Peter, uh, 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 Attorney Zucker, is he He's by on. Zoom. Zoom. I mean, I'm zoomed in. Thank there you. He is. Very good. Thank you very much. And, and Margaret Watson. Is she participating she's tonight? She's in if she's there. So we'll give her another moment, and then uh, Ronald Quicaro. Yes, I'm here. All right, you? there you are. All right, very good. So we'll wait, Alex, if you uh, see Margaret populate, if you could bring her over with privileges, that would be helpful. And then in the meantime, um, oh, someone else. Can I just double check? I just sent uh, Alexandra a uh, presentation for reference, if necessary. Did you receive that? Alexandra. And uh, she's just checking her email now. Okay. We, Ron, we, we spoke um, in between, and she has the ability to pull up our original application. So I, that, okay. that should Fair do enough. the same thing. Great. Thanks. Next time, you want me to participate in your presentation, please. Please, 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 uh, and good point. Um, so, I think we'd like to have Mr. Zaka go first okay. for our presentation, and then um, follow up with myself, the civil engineer, mainly for site circulation, which seems to be the crux of this project, and then uh, Ron for any architectural questions. Okay. So we'll give Alex a minute to. Very close. There's the application. So this is what uh, participants yeah. at home are seeing, correct? Yeah. So um, if you scroll down um, to uh, uh, the plan that's, I think it's C100, it should say layout of materials. That's probably Wait, the best one. That's where she's at already. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's C200. C200. Yeah. We're at C100. Our system takes a moment to sure. reload. So that, that, that's probably the best plan. Um, to keep up on the screen, I don't know if it's possible to toggle between that one and the color PDF, which matches the board that I have here. Okay, so we could keep that one up. And oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm saying, do you have the ability to mainly use this plan, but then toggle back and forth between this one 
and the colored one that I emailed you, which matches this one up on the board. <clears throat> Yes. Oh, this this colored plan up on the screen. Oh, I, I thought you were going to tell me that. Great. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then you wanted to start with uh, Attorney Zaka. Is yes, that correct? Yes, that's correct. Attorney Zaka, you have a con. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief uh, and quick overview. Uh, most of the talking tonight will be done by Derek and possibly Ron. <clears throat> um, property, of course, in front of you is 1063 Great Plain Avenue, the Needham Bank property, which is about currently has about 45,000 square feet of land, occupied by about a just shy about 34,580 square foot building, as well as a freestanding drive-up uh, ATM. <clears throat> what we're proposing this evening, as you'll see, is to increase floor area on the site by under 1,700, just shy of 1,700 square feet, which consists of ex an existing, uh, take an existing mezzanine within the building and converted, converting that to executive offices of about 1,365 square feet and adding an existing drive up freestanding automatic telemachine that's there now will be removed and will add a 321 square foot drive up tele building with the new drive up ATM. Uh, as the board is probably aware, uh, Needham Bank's been around for a while. It's been in the town since the late 1800s. It uh, actually started at 1063 Great Plain Ave back in 1922. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to give a year-by-year, blow-by-blow description of what they've done. I would like to, though, remind the board, and I'm not sure who was there, but back in 2012, it was probably a, one of the major uh, improvements made by the bank, and as you're probably aware, and Needham Bank has a history of, I'm going to use the word modernizing or addressing uh, customer needs as those customer needs uh, and experiences change. Uh, and then back in 2012, uh, the board may recall, we eliminated uh, what used to be called Eaton Square. Uh, and the bank, uh, in conjunction with the town, did a, I'm going to call it a, a cooperative or joint uh, project uh, where the municipal parking lot and the Needham Bank parking lot uh, were totally redone uh, almost as a single parking lot. And at that time, uh, the bank added uh, approximately just under 12,000 square foot additional space to the bank building and added the drive up uh, ATM. Uh, so the reason we're here, as I'm saying, is <clears throat> the bank uh, continues to make improvements uh, for customer experience. Uh, I think there was a trend uh, in the direction that we're going uh, well before COVID, where more and more people were are using uh, electronic banking. Uh, fewer people are going physically into the bank unless they have a reason to sit down with a bank executive, be it a mortgage, be it uh, investments, et cetera. Uh, COVID really, I think, amplified that. Uh, and between that and the technolo technological improvements uh, that have been made, uh, people are just not banking the way they used to, and Needham Bank is looking to address that. Uh, again, as I said, there's been a dramatic spike increase in the utilization of online and electronic banking, and I was proud to say that that includes my 90-year-old mother, uh, who during COVID uh, learned how to do all her banking practically online. 
There's also been, as I say, a decrease in customers physically coming to the bank. And when they do come to the bank, they prefer to utilize drive-through tellers and or ATM machines. And as I say, the exception of those who come in to meet privately with the bank personnel. So during the COVID period, on top of all of that, the bank had a majority of the bank employees working remotely. And they've kept at least a limit on a limited basis, most of this ability for their employees to work remotely. It's not full time, but many of them are clearly two or three days not coming to the bank itself. So to address all of the above, as I say, we want to convert the existing mezzanine area to executive offices, about 1,365 square feet of floor area. And this basically would free up the existing executive offices for when there is a need for private customer conferences. In addition, as I say, we're proposed to demolish the existing drive-up ATM and replace that with a 321 square foot drive-through teller with a drive-through ATM. I'm just going to add that we did have several meetings with the department heads, with the help of the planning office that has helped us locate where we're putting the current building so that we appropriately, A, have it in the right zoning district, and B, have it appropriately set off from the property lines as required. And I know in addition to that, we recently met with the design board, and I thought that went very well. They seem to like the project. So having said that, that's the general overview. That's why we're here. Derek will probably take it from here to show you exactly what we're doing in terms of the technical aspects of the project. Before I do that, just a couple of comments on the existing drive-through. Because during COVID, we did get a lot of complaints on the drive-up ATM. The way it's situated now, it has a curb cut that jumps out after the customer drives up to the existing drive-up ATM. And that forces them to sometimes step out of that car because they don't want to hit their tire onto that curb jut that's there. So I don't think that was well designed in the original, and this would correct that. In addition, the ATM that's there is a D-bolt ATM that is now going on 11 years old and has been out of service from a manufacturer standpoint for now over six years. So it is the last of the D-bolt fleet that we have replaced. This is the last as well as the walk-up one in the building. So we're trying to get all of our fleet on the same NCR technology. And this would be the last in making us one plus hoop. Every time we've added a new NCR replacement for the D-bolt, our customer complaints have gone down as it's much more receptive to the new technology and accessibility, ADA requirements, everything. So it is imperative that we replace those ATMs. We hope so. That's all. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So as Peter mentioned, we are proposing to construct an additional structure here, which is 321 square feet. So just to give you order of magnitude, that's roughly the size of slightly bigger than a parking space, maybe a single car garage in size and one story. We had the benefit here of an existing parking lot pre-developed, very few grade changes in the parking lot, a flat area to work with. Also sort of the benefit of siting the building in between two existing curb cuts and the parking lot in general has great sight distance anyway. You can sort of see the whole lot from anywhere within the lot. So that was a real benefit to where we were siting it and how we were going to look at site circulation. So I'm going to focus mostly on the revisions and the safety of the site circulation. I think that's the important aspect here. So I'm going to try to explain it and point at the same time. Currently, the ATM 
single drive up ATM is in this area, and that's exactly where we're also proposing um, the new building. Um, so, to use this facility, you would Great Plain Avenue is down here. Here's Garden Street. Um, this is currently already a one way entrance into the bank parking lot. You would decide uh, whether you were going to go to the ATM or the uh, teller somewhere um, right as you enter the site, or you would continue into the parking lot in a one way circulation pattern. Um, you would continue on the one-way circulation pattern um, in a counterclockwise direction, um, or you could continue in a two-way for the rest of the parking lot. Um, so some of the improvements that we've made, um, we needed a little more area. We tried to minimize it. We needed some more area to, to site the building, so we did have to um, eliminate five parking spaces. Um, from the from the current layout, four of those spaces are in this area to accommodate the wider uh, width that we needed. But we also didn't. We also wanted to provide some landscaping and um, maintain the walkway. Um, you would decide at this point whether to go to the ATM machine or the teller window, and so cards would be in this area here and here. Uh, potentially a few queued up. Um, we don't expect any major queues. Um, and then you would leave the facility through the second, uh, second curb cut. Um, the second curb cut would remain as it is with a two-way um, in-out curb cut. Um, however, the change we would make would be that you could no longer take a right to enter the site and circulate that you would have to excuse, take a look here. Excuse me, Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I can see what's going on. I can tell what's going on. But the fact that the uh, the physical one in the auditorium is being pointed to versus the one that's on the screen doesn't doesn't allow people via Zoom to actually go to see what's going on. Be yeah. better it would be better if that's off the screen and the camera could focus on the one that's in the, in the room if that's the one that's being pointed to by the marker. So, so I just wanted to, wanted to relay that these people on Zoom can't really see what's going on. I, uh, you know, we have to deal with the limitations of what we have. Um, I understand. I understand so. that. And, and, and dealing with it is by doing what I just said. Yeah, All right. very, that's a good point. Um, what's on the screen? Can't it match what's being discussed, or is it some? There's in the, in the room. There's something different, Gene, uh, and he's oh. he's pointing to, to yes. something different. And we don't have we don't have a, another camera to be able in the room to be able no, no, to the, no, to the, show the that. Camera, no, the cam no, the, that's not true. The camera was showing. The camera was showing. Well, I, my apologies, John. I, I forget your name. My apologies for not really remembering the name. But it was pointing to what what was being described. So we do have a camera that will show that 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 easel. It's, what is on that it, it, I think it's an it's it's a it's a remote camera. There's no one already in you know um, fielding that camera. It's re, it's uh, it's remote, and we don't have the full technology suite, and including all the telecommunications. Uh, facilities that we otherwise would ordinarily benefit from to have someone who's physically running that camera. They're not present here. You can't see that. I understand what you're saying. I now see on the screen, uh, you know, what you were referring to what, that Derek can, um, that Derek can continue to point to so we can continue with that for that screen for the. And, and, I, and, I, can, and I can appreciate, Mr. Chair, how you weren't seeing what we were seeing on Zoom. So I can appreciate how it wasn't obvious to, 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 to you. So I can appreciate that fact. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, so I was uh, I was just about concluding. Um, in conclusion, I you know the 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 building is being sited roughly in the same general vicinity of where we already have the ATM, um, and the the site circulation was something we took seriously here, and I think we have a good solution. Um, there's some uh, additional signage that we're proposing that's on our site plans. Um, there's some modifications and new um, directional arrows, some additional stop conditions uh, with stop signs and, and uh, stop lines. 
and um, um, that was how we addressed the uh, the site circulation. And then I'm also happy to answer any other questions um, related are you, to civil. Um, are you able to also discuss uh, the renovation to the mezzanine space? Yes. I like to see a visual representation of that, but Alex, I think that means that we'll probably unfortunately need you. No. Um, what I have is I think A1.01. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Again, we're looking for A101. There you go. Oh, actually, it's funny. I have online A101 is the internal space, the mezzanine space. No, actually. Actually, that looks like it's the drive through. Oh, yes. So I'm looking for this. We have A101, which is the mezzanines, which is for the interior space. Yeah. And then we have A101 here. This one, this one might be. How would. Um, oh, you want to look at the floor plan of the. I want, to see, I want people at home to see what I'm seeing right now. Inside of the branch. The inside Correct. of the existing, so it exist proposed floor plans. Right there. Right there. Oh, they yeah. have the same Name. Number. Yes, exactly. All right, thanks, Alex. Yes. Uh, so, um, Ron, you want you want to take this, or do you want me to? No, I can I can speak, you know, kind of briefly to this as an overview. So, um, thank you for whomever got this right image up. Um, the floor plan on the right, there's two floor plans. Floor plan on the right is uh, the first floor. Floor plan on the left is the second. Um, there's uh, uh, kind of groupings from um, the front of the building to the, to the rear of basically clustered buildings and additions over the years. Um, the subject area we're talking about is in the lower left-hand corner, which is the corner of uh, Gray Plain and Garden, uh, if I'm remembering them correctly. Um, essentially, that lower left quadrant, that lower left corner that you see on both the right-hand side and the left-hand side, specifically the left-hand side we're speaking to, um, is today a double height space. Um, it is you know, two stories in height, a single story, but you can see all the way up to a, um, what, would, what could be a second floor ceiling. So we're taking advantage of that volume and adding this um, intermediate floor. Um, there are a few executive offices, I think three in total, or two, two in total with some support space, a conference room, some waiting area, and then an opening to the floor below. That's that kind of X you see in the plan. So that's essentially the interior program increase that we're referring to. Does that um, answer your question? I, th I think so. On the page before that, um, Alex, I apologize. That would be uh, 0100. On the bottom left, that says open to below. So that's the existing condition, if I understand correctly. What you're proposing is to eliminate that two-story entranceway and to um, uh, add support so then you can then add onto, that, onto the second floor a mezzanine, a mezzanine space that includes, uh, um, there's still a section that's open to below, but there's an admin office, an area for coffee, um, another office, another office with like a conference table and then another conference room. So that's, and that accounts for your 1300 or and change internal mezzanine square foot that's right. renovation. Yeah. And then yeah, well, so what you, said, what you said is generally correct, just to clarify the, the two story entry that you see today will stay. It's the space just to the left of that 
where the main teller area is that we are taking advantage of the open to the law that you refer to. With the X on it. So part of that space with the X on it now is going to be utilized as finished space. Yes. Right. And actually, if you look at the if you look at that second floor existing plan, there's two X areas. There's two X's. There's a sort of small X. The small X, smaller narrow X, is a double story or two story entry. That's there. Yes. The bit larger X on the yes. left is the subject area. Yes, exactly. That's right. I understand that. Right. Thank you very much. I don't know if people at home can see that because we're not able to point to it online. But I think that oh, there we go. Alex, thank you very much. And then, um, and then on the next page, thanks, Alex. It's that area. So yeah, and if you just right there, whoop, if you can go back just a little bit more to the right, a little more to the right. Technical difficulties, we appreciate your patience. So, so there is this quarter moon rounded area. So you'll be able to look up yes. from the branch level and into that mezzanine space. And see that. <laughs> and it'll have visual like, light that'll transpire down and open up that space down below. So okay. it's not totally closed off. I see that. Okay. That main hallway entrance will stay two stories open, too. Very good. Uh, that's helpful for me. Um, I appreciate the explanation for the exterior uh, modification to improve the uh, site circulation and to change the old technology to the new and also to incorporate an in-person drive-up teller that's roughly 300 square feet in space that you were also referring to. Um, before I open this up to uh, planning board members, comments and questions, uh, I do, for the record, uh, want to know we've received the following comments from the town departments. Um, uh, by email on August the 2nd from Fire Chief uh, Tom Conroy, he has no issues. By email on August the 10th from Assistant Public Health Director Tara Gurge, she has no issues. By letter dated August 10 from Town Engineer Tom Ryder, no issues. By memo dated August 8 from the Design Review Board, um, uh, they have approved the applicant's plan. Alex, I, I'm putting you on the spot here, or Lee. Do you recall whether we've received anything from uh, Police Chief Schlittler? Yeah, we received something on Monday, and I added to the packet on Monday, and it was no comment. And it was no comment. I saw, uh, I saw that from the fire chief, I think. Uh, or I did see that. I think that was for another project, but I, that's, I appreciate you confirming that was also for this one. All right. Um, so now I'd open this up to my co my colleagues for any comments or questions. Paul, do you have any comments or no, questions? No, no comments or questions from me. I'm fine. Artie Crocker? Uh, not, just well, this one minor one. That is, uh, and my apologies if I missed this, this one, my very minor one. And that is this related to the perm, you know, is there any permeable increase, or, yeah, is, or sorry, is there any impermeable increase in surface area here at all? Are you simply shuffling pavement around and keeping the same, let's say, green space planted, planters, plantings? Because I mean, I understand why you're doing it. I think it's fabulous. I'm just, yeah. And I think I could comment about some planting, but if you just readdress that, please. Um, I don't have the exact number uh, in front of me. Uh, there is a very, very small increase in impervious area. Um, Insignificant and de minimis, I would estimate it's in the you know 200 square feet. So the there's a little bit of a, um, moving around. Um, the, the the new building isn't entirely new impervious, um, but it's uh, there is a slight increase. Yeah. Artie, do you have any but, other but questions? You, but, but you are dealing with some plantings around. You're, you're dealing with some plantings around the building. 
something to that effect, I believe. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. The, the, in general, banks have very nicely maintained uh, planting. So we're, we're maintaining what we have and we'll be um, protecting some of the mature shrubs and trees and also supplementing with some new landscape. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anything further, Artie? No, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you very much. Jean, do you have any comments? Yes. Um, I used to live at the corner of May and Garden Street, and uh, I recall very well when the plans came in uh, for the various, um, the new building for the bank on Garden Street and for the prior renovations of the parking lot. Um, and first of all, I want to say how, what a wonderful building that new bank building is on Garden Street and how well it fits into the neighborhood, considering that, you know, residence is across the street. So I know it's your intention to do a good job here. Um, but I'm, was looking, I'm looking at sheet 5A5.01, which is the uh, after view from Garden Street. And I'm recalling that the neighbors, particularly those who lived right across from this, um, uh, were very concerned about um, uh, uh, trees and shrubs along the edge, wanting to see them, screening the parking lot, et cetera. And when I look at uh, A501, um, I don't see any plantings. I mean, I, at least I don't see any that are right in front of the building. Just, uh, uh, Gina, yeah. Jean, I'm going to stop you right there for one moment, please. So that, Alex, that's perfect. I just yeah, want. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, that plan. And then also the, there is a, um, a landscape plan, uh, L101. You don't have to turn to it, but I, I think my question will be understood. Um, there's a, uh, a, note, a note existing. Um, uh, um, existing honey locust and etc. to be relocated and it's not clear to me is is there an existing tree or trees that separate this area that's going to be for the drive up from Garden Street and will, those trees aren't shown on any of these plants that I can see so, um, on A501, but are there trees? Will they be detained? When the legend speaks of relocating, are they going to be relocated somewhere else on the site? Which wouldn't be good because the whole idea is to provide screen on the edge for the sake of the residents of Garden Street. Sure. Derek, can I speak for one 30 seconds and then I'll defer to you? If sure, that's no okay. problem. Okay, so I just want to mention, in, you know, in regard to A501, um, I think, you know, I, I understand your concern, your point. Um, I would say the site plans and the landscaping plans uh, that are submitted fully supersede these drawings. These drawings are intended to sort of reveal and expose and study the, the architectural structure. Um, if we were to, in fact, veil that with plantings as they are planting, as, as Derek will probably walk you through, we wouldn't really be able to study the building. So um, if you can look at these four drawings on A501 as just about the building um, mm -hmm. and not about the screening of the building, they are, that is not included or explored whatsoever on these four drawings. So Derek, if you could talk about the plants from there, that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. The purpose of these plans was more the materials of the building. Um, so they do not include um, our intention for the landscaping. Um, the landscaping sheet L100 um, was designed by our landscape designer. Um, the landscaping is quite robust. That was one of the design um, goals here was to provide uh, um, uh, plantings and screening between Garden Street and the and the new structure. Um, there are some nice honey locusts that aren't so big that they cannot be uh, replanted. So that's some of the notation on of the honey locusts is that we would we're gonna we're gonna keep them. There's I think three of them there existing, and um, one in particular 
will be maintained and kept in the same general vicinity, uh, but does need to be replanted. And then in addition to that, um, we're supplementing what's already out there, so it'll be an improvement. And um, the lot itself, where we're removing five spaces, we're actually increasing um, some of the island areas, which will uh, uh, also be uh, landscaped as well. Okay. Yeah, I did notice that. But um, if you if just focus on the, um, the setback area between the building and Garden Street, uh, at, is, am I reading L100 correctly? Will there be three trees or four trees or what? You're reading that correctly. I believe there's three now, and um, I'm looking at it right now. There'll be there'll be three in the final condition. Okay, and then there'll also be the various bushes that are shown on the landscape plan. Correct, bushes and perennial grasses. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, does anyone else from the board have any comments or additional questions? Um, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn to uh, the public. Um, uh, Alex, do we have any, I apologize, because you've been kind of running their presentation for them and trying to keep our... Uh, I just have one attendee who is not raising his hand. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I look in the room. We don't have anyone here with a hand up. Uh, so. Um, with that, uh, is, is there, uh, um, do we have sufficient evidence to, and testimony to close the hearing and decide? Mr. Chair, I move we close the hearing. We have a motion to close the hearing. Do we have a second? Second. second. We have a motion by Paul Alpert, a second by Artie Crocker. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote in alphabetical order. Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Uh, Jean McKnight? Aye. And uh, the chair is aye. The hearing is closed. We thank you both for coming. Thank you all three of you for coming. And thank you for uh, the Needham Bank uh, people that were here online on Zoom, uh, the specialists. Good to meet you, Jim. Derek, thank you very kindly. Thanks, Thanks for you. coming. We apologize for the thank delay you. and appreciate your patience. Great. No thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Uh, very yeah. good. Quick thank question. You. Do you, as a, as a process, yeah. do you... Um, put it on the next agenda to finalize um, conditions? Is that your general practice? So, uh, so I think, uh, uh, Lee, um, when would you intend to schedule? I think, our, I think our goal and our plan, our, our goal is to have this, um, a draft decision in front of the board um, on September the 7th when they next meet. We have another hearing on September 7th, is that correct? Said. We have another hearing, but I think the goal would be to get the decision on this project, you know, on your agenda so that you can vote it on at that meeting. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So that would be okay. the intent so far. Um, I'm not careful. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Time is of the essence, so I'll um, add that. Understood. Well, we're in a drought, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The plantings <laughs> might have to wait. Thank you. Thank so. you very, very, thank you very thank kindly. You lips to God's ears. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. At this point um, in our agenda, uh, I uh, turn to the request uh, to release the uh, uh, bond for Hutter Ridge, uh, located at 1135 Webster Street, um, uh, the definitive subdivision. I note for the record that we've received, we received a. Uh, a um, uh, a letter from April 7th, from uh, April the 5th, rather, from our town engineer acknowledging the work. I think it was uh, uh, com uh, acknowledging that, that uh, I think on the 5th, that they were going to go through for a uh, town meeting to accept uh, the road. <coughs> and a, um, a letter from town engineer on August the 10th uh, saying that the work is complete. And we have from July 25th a letter from their attorney, John Connolly, uh, requesting release of the remaining $10,000 uh, on the bond. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions about this release? So, Lee, at this point, do we just take a vote to release the bond? Yes. At this point, 
in time, you just need to vote to release the $10,000 um, uh, performance bond, and we're still retaining the off-street drainage bond for that subdivision. But the $10,000 performance bond can be released. And that's and we have acknowledgement, as I mentioned, from the town engineer that that work had been complete. Yes, and the street's been accepted. It was accepted at the most recent town meeting. Do you want to so comments? I, Mr. Chair, I move that we um, release the performance bond for the Hunter Ridge Road um, sub subdivision plan at 1135 Webster Street. We have a motion by Paul Alpert. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Artie Crocker. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote. Uh, Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, we have uh, unanimously decided to um, release the, uh, uh, the uh, $10,000 bond uh, for the 1135 Webster Street definitive subdivision. Now come the minutes for June 7th and June 21st. Uh, yes, if I uh, may uh, present just a couple of questions that are highlighted in yellow on June 7th, um, um, just so we can decide what to do about those uh, those parts that were in clear. Uh, at the bottom of page two, there's uh, a sentence that says, the visual length of the, of the Highland Avenue has been reduced by 35 feet. That is, sentence is completely unclear. It's not clear what it relates to or what length it's talking about. Um, I propose just deleting the sentence. I don't think it adds anything, and I don't know what it means. Somebody would have to review the entire recording to try to figure it out. Does anybody think that's important enough to follow up and try to find out what it really was to, meant to say, or should we just delete it? I think I think they might. I mean, I don't think it's going to hurt you if we just delete. But I think they might have been referring to the fact that. There's, there's been a cutout in the building, which then gives this kind of visual separation so it doesn't seem as long as it was. That may be what's being referred to, but I'm fine either way. Sitting here, I'm not taking it up. In comparison, you mean to a previous iteration? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. At some point, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they changed, they changed oh. it to break it up. Yeah, they change it to change, usually break up the length, the width of the length of the building on holiday. I think you're right. You're you're triggering my memory, Artie. I think you're right. And so the maybe all we say is the visual length of the building. Um, well, it's not even just the visual length, but the building <coughs> on on the Highland. I would say on the Highland Avenue frontage. Yeah has been reduced by 35 feet. Okay? Very good. All right. Then in the in the next paragraph, which is right after that on route to, uh, no, page three, I think it's just certain trees in the second line were misspelled. Um, I tried to, uh, to Google and find a tree that's called Linder, uh, L-I-N-D-E-R. There's no such thing. There's Linden's. And locus, I guess locus. I think you're right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a pretty I'm easy one. I'm not going to map terminology. We've got the three terminology. Okay, we'll make those changes. Um, on um, page uh, uh, six, um, uh, in the paragraph third from the bottom of the page six, um, um, Doug Fox's comment, he says in the second uh, line, he feels they should start at seven, and I think it might be a dot there, that he feels they should start at point seven. I think he's referring to floor area ratio. He was. And if, he was. Yeah. 
So we, should, we just put in FAR. I think people would know what that means. Okay. And, and, and Gene, to your point, um, whenever I, whenever in all the correspondence that I have, engineering stuff I'm doing, whenever there's a point, they put a zero before it. So 0 0.7, then it becomes quite clear that it's 0.7. That's a good idea. So if, if 0 0.7, okay. Um, then last thing, um, this is rather minor, but on page seven, um, the, Mr. Harker is quoted in the second line saying, commuter bicyclists are already bike with cars. Um, do you mean to, to say on roads or on roadways with cars? Uh, that's certainly what, I mean, what I was referring to, that they, that they've learned, you know, the, the, the commuter bicyclists have learned to be, be within the, the, the car lanes and use the and use the laws the, the laws of the road related to how bikes are supposed to be used. That's what it would be right. So is it sufficient to leave it the way you had it? Commuter bicyclists already bike with cars? Yes, that's uh, fine. All right, we'll just leave it alone. I'm, 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 fine, I'm fine putting on roadway with cars. I'm fine adding that in there. It's 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 uh, it sounds a little bit more um, intelligent as far as what actually is going on. Okay. Gene, okay, so we'll, we'll make the change. Okay. That's, Gene, that's clarity. That's it then. Gene, um, Gene, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, also, actually, on page four, you had a comment that we did not discuss. Oh, really? It's I might have missed it. Uh, which is on the second paragraph. The sidewalks will be rebuilt oh, from the. Thank you, you. You intended yeah. to remove the. Will be rebuilt from Highland Gould, from oh from the Highland, from the Gould Highland intersection to Noana. Noana. Yeah. Is that is that what's meant? Because from Gould to Noana um, doesn't really make sense because it's all Gould. Right? So they must be talking about the intersection of Golden Highland. No, that is the street that yes, uh, comes right. into uh, Gould, right? So the rebuilding of the sidewalks would be... Well, I think, I think, it's, I think, what, you, I think what you've done is it makes it, it makes it, it I think it's appropriate, perfectly appropriate to, to cite an intersection down to a certain road. I mean, there are other ways of wording it, but there's nothing. Wrong with I, I'm, I'm, fi I'm fine with it. I just wanted to make sure that, for the record, yeah, it was resolved. Yeah, thank you, thank That's you very fine. much, uh, Adam. Okay, very good. so we're good with with this with saying rebuild from the Gould Highland intersection to Noanet. Okay. All right then. Uh, that and the red the red lining is just uh, non-substantive changes uh, for clarity or. Um, or spelling or grammar. So uh, I move that we accept the minutes of June 7th, 2022, with the changes discussed tonight uh, as redlined. We have a motion. We have a we have a motion by Jean McKnight, a second by Artie Crocker, to approve the minutes of June the 7th. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote uh, in alphabetical order. Paul Albert. Aye. Artie Crocker. Aye. Gene McKnight? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We've accepted the minutes of June the 7th. Uh, and Gene, the minutes of June 20, uh, as, as uh, discussed tonight um, and as redlined, uh, the minutes from June 21st, I don't believe, had any comments. So did I miss I anything? I haven't had an opportunity to review them. OK. And I haven't even read them. Oh dear. So if others have read them and feel comfortable, to be my guest, but I'm going to refrain from voting on it. Very good. We'll take that up at another time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Lee, did you want to discuss uh, uh, December meeting dates? Uh, yes. We normally meet on the first and the third uh, Tuesday of the month, um, and, but you know, in December we have the Christmas holidays. And the select board and the school committee have changed when they're going to meet, and they've kind of jumped on our schedule. So they're meeting on the 6th and the 20th, and the reason that that's important is that we are covered by cable, um, and they can only cover two boards. So they're covering the select board, um, and they're covering the school committee on what we're 
you know, previously our date. So I think we need to find alternatives for uh, that month. So there are a couple options. Um, one option is, you know, during the same weeks we normally meet, we choose a different day. We either meet on a Monday or a Wednesday, um, which is what I would recommend we do. The other option is to have them just one meeting that month, but I think that would that, that probably wouldn't that would probably be just too tight for us given our our current permitting schedule. So we so you're so uh, do we need a mo we don't need a motion to change our schedule, right? No, we don't need a motion. It's just I want to you know I want to put it, I want to agree on some alternative times because you know as po as projects come in and we're scheduling hearings, you know a month or. A month and a half out. I just want to uh, agree on what our schedule change will be in December. So I would propose that we do December the fifth instead of December the sixth, and December the nineteenth instead of December the twentieth. Does okay, that? So Monday. On Monday, that correct. Thank um, you. The nineteenth is Hanukkah, according to the, my calendar. Paul, is that a problem for people of the oh, Jewish that's, faith? That's not a problem for me. Adam, do I've you been, want to be home for Hanukkah for yourself? I have a 10-year-old. We'll light the menorah and, and do presents and maybe, maybe some people in the That would be adorable. Yeah. I'd love that. <laughs> uh, can we can you check with lighting. town council to make sure that it's constitutionally committed? <laughs> <laughs> what if we did the 21st instead? That's, uh, that's fun. That's getting awfully Fine. close to Christmas. I mean, Christmas is Monday, I think. So you know, the Christmas weekend is. I'm I'm just commenting on it. Um, so is Monday, December nineteenth, the first night of Hanukkah? Monday the nineteenth is the it first. It says night. first day. It says first day on my calendar. Yeah. First yeah. day. So, so Sunday's Sunday is probably first night. Oh, Sunday is Arrow. Yeah, Sunday is right. probably first night. Yeah. So we're just going to confirm that, and then if so, I'm looking it up right now. Very good. So then I, I, I'm fine to do it on the 19th. Okay, good. Okay, that's good with me. I might actually, though, what I will say is uh, can we do it at 7.30 instead of at 7 so I still have a little bit of time to... Yeah, light the candles because it'll be getting dark early. Yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the, I, uh, I've got something for the first, second, third night and I still have to fill out the other five nights. So, All right. Okay. So just to summarize, it's, it's December 5th at 7 and December 19th at 7.30? Yes. Alex, you have that? Okay. You're nodding. Exactly. All right. We're all set. So that's well done. Location TBD at probably Charles River. Oh, that's fun. Very good. By then, we do anticipate uh, our facilities to be operational for... Okay, so I cannot change it on my calendar because it's from. A she'll she'll do that after. Yeah. Alex will do that after. Are you okay with that to accommodate Hanukkah? Oh yeah, yeah. And Christmas. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, All right. I mean, I'm a Unitarian. I'm good. I'm good no matter what's going on. <laughs> uh, well, if you're Unitarian, you should be lighting the candles. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I said, Paul, I'm good with whatever's going on. <laughs> yeah. You're good at my house, are you? Come okay. light the menorah. Uh, all right, very good. So, uh, Lee, do you want to run us through um, your report? Do you have a report for tonight? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, just a couple items, I think. I just want to, you know, point out, I think I sent everybody um, the final um, um, DHCD guidelines um, for, MBT, MB, for MBT communities that you know, came out last week. Uh, I think I sent everybody a copy of the actual draft guidelines, um, and we're, we're currently reviewing them to understand what their implications are for NEEDM. Um, I think there were two pieces of good news out of them. One is that we've now classified as a commuter rail town community, which means that the total number of units we have to provide has been reduced from, I think, around 2,300 to around 1,700. And also our deadline for compliance um, has been moved from um, December of 2023 out to, to, out to the end of December of 2024. So um, this information has been shared, I think, with you, the select board, and the housing working group, um, and it's certainly going to frame the continued work of the, of the housing working group. 
Um, and also the draft environmental impact report on the Highland Science Center project came out at the end of last month. Um, and comments are due back from the town um, next week, Monday. And so Encore GPI is doing a review of that draft report uh, to ensure that the comments that the town had raised um, earlier have been addressed, and if not, what the deficiencies are, and we're been working with Rebecca Brown on that. Um, and DPW is also doing a review of the draft report to ensure that the concerns and comments that they raised are, have also been addressed in that draft report. Um, and so I'm coordinating with them with the, for, and the town manager's office for a response that's um, due next week, Monday. Um, and then I just, just would just kind of point out that on the calendar looking forward on September 7th, we received um, electronically today, uh, we, have, we have the continued hearing on the Highland Science Center schedule. And we received today electronically a revised set of drawings from the applicant you know, reflecting some of the comments the board had raised at the last meeting, in particular, um, the layout of Bull Street and its, its, incorporate, its, its original treatment as an easement across the property, and now it's being moved so that it's actually going to be managed within the right-of-way, and some additional documentation. And that's also going to be reviewed by GPI and the staff, and so that should be ready for the public hearing that we um, plan for September 7th on that. And also on September 7th, we have the hearing planned on the brewery zoning. So that um, is kind of looking out to <coughs> September 7th, what's on, what's on the radar. And also that the housing working group is going to be meeting, I think, on September 8th. Um, and um, we're all, Jean and Karen Sonneborg and I are all working. Karen's trying to put together the draft housing plan, which the committee will be looking at at their meeting on September the 8th. Thank you, um, Murray. Oh, I, if, yes. I, if I could add um, to that on the Housing Plan Working Group. Um, and Lee, I actually thought our meeting on September 8th uh, was, is to review the MBTA guidelines and to have the subgroups uh, present their priorities and strategies as their final reports. And then the September 29th was review of the preliminary draft housing plan. I think you're right. I might have, I might have got, I might have it wrong in my head. You might, I think you're right, Jean. I think you're yeah, right. Yeah, I'm looking at the proposed revised schedule that was discussed a couple right. weeks ago. Right, you're right. We, we, we changed it. You're right. Yeah. So, um, uh, with regard to the uh, MBTA guidelines, um, it's, it's, it's a good thing, of course, that they got rid of that bus uh, schedule, bus uh, terminology uh, entirely. So. Um, we are now a community that has to provide 15% of its total dwelling units, you know, for future zoning. Um, but one of the mo most difficult things, oh, oh, I should also point out, they, they've very, very much, very much fine-tuned uh, what the obligations are for various communities so that the, the smaller communities, especially those that don't actually have any mass transit in their towns, but only adjacent to other communities, their obligation has been greatly reduced. There's a table attached to the guidelines that um, very much fine tunes uh, those re requirements for those small towns, but it hasn't really changed for Needham. But as part of that fine tuning, because we have so much acreage within a half mile of four check transit stations, um, actually we have to have 90% of our proposed uh, rezoning um, areas within a half mile area. Uh, and it used to, the prior version made us think we could have you know, half of it outside the area and half of it in, but now they want 90% within the area. And we're still dealing with, uh, we have to have a total of 50 acres and 25 acres of it have to be contiguous. Um, and that we're finding hard um, uh, to expand some of our areas so that they are 25 acres. So we're really struggling with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we have. Uh, oh, oh we excuse me. Um, one more question, Lee, sure. on um, on the Highland, whatever. The, what are they calling it? The uh, Highland Science Center. Um, 
Yeah, do the new plans show the new layout of Highland Avenue? I just got these plans today at four o'clock. <laughs> I have not looked at them. They came in by. Okay. They came in, they came in electronically so today, hours. and the hard copies are being Less. dropped off tomorrow yeah. morning. So. All right. Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm very curious about that because I that's did, what I did have a specifically a conversation with Rebecca to, to check the latest plans of record um, to make sure that the layout um, is consistent with the latest plans of record, so that your issue is is addressed. Absolutely, um, and it's not my issue. It's compliance with the zoning. Well, it's a compliance. It's, it's, well, it's the issue that you raised and brought to my attention. So it's being, right, right. It's, being it's being looked at. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jean uh, and Lee. Thanks for your report. Uh, for correspondence, we've received a letter from uh, Lee to Kate dated July 1, um, uh, acknowledging our uh, um, shared uh, our support of the, some of the select board's goals, and in particular with the housing plan working group. Um, we've received an email. Uh, dated August 1 from David Lazarus with respect to uh, 44 Charles River Street. And we've also received an email dated uh, August the 2nd from uh, Cindy and Bill uh, um, Katile, uh, also regarding uh, 44 Charles River Street. Um, and that is our correspondence. Uh, Alex or Lee, did either of you have any other correspondence that we've received late in the game. Anything else? Uh, very good. Does any board member have any other comments or questions? I just want to comment that 484 Charles River Street, yeah, for the, those watchers who don't might not know what that's referring to, is a very large acreage uh, parcel uh, that the uh, heirs of the original owner uh, want to, want to uh, dispose of and the town has been interested in acquiring uh, some of that parcel for conservation purposes. And I have no idea what the status is, but that's what the people are writing about. So let me fill in what I've heard about that. First of all, it's not just 484. There are also two, um, three, slightly more than three acre parcels that are that front on uh, Charles River Street so that it's a total of um, uh, around 20, 24 to 25 acres. Um, so what happened was that originally uh, the property was on the market. Um, the town had uh, partnered with a land developer to make a bid. Um, the Foster family accepted bids. I don't know how many bids they got. Um, but they went with the highest bid. Uh, I was told that they actually signed a purchase and sale agreement and got a deposit, and then the, the, the party that was going to buy it um, walked away from that deal. Uh, so it's back on the market at a slightly reduced price, uh, and the town is now uh, in discussions with the Foster family uh, to see to see what uh, we can do. I believe, again, this is all just kind of hearsay evidence, um, but I believe that the town is still partnering with the same um, developer to try to have a, a, a partnership where the, the developer puts in a development of some kind and the town gets, gets some conservation land. Well, that's good news. Thank you for, for that, Paul. Thanks for the update. Hey, Paul, at one point I thought I heard that the town was also reaching out to some conservation groups and cells to try to form some partnership as well. Did you hear anything about that? No, I, I have not, but that would be nice. Okay. I, uh, I serve on the board of the Needham Land Trust, and I haven't heard of any such outreach. Thank you. And thanks for the explanation of uh, uh, that geographic area and what people are referring to. Um, I know that many are, you know, interested in seeing that that, as much of that land as possible be preserved, uh, and yet it's on the open market and the market forces tend to do as they do. Uh, 
Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We second. Have, we have a motion by Artie and a second by Jean. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote. Paul Elpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>